Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I thank you for being here with us. We must go on in the next subject uh, about the tailored therapy in myositis. Uh, and uh, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Anne Kempar, that is uh, an internist. And because of that, I already see today in the morning a lot of patients. Uh, an outstanding member of the clinical immunology unit of our hospital. She has been dedicated for many years uh, to autoimmune diseases with special emphasis on systemic lupus erythematosus and inflammatory myopathies. Myositis, myositis are an area of autoimmunity we, in which knowledge has been greatly expanded in recent years. Muscle involvement may occur uh, without or with associated myositis. Time is often scarce for us to choose the appropriate therapy because the diagnosis is not yet secure. But we must avoid irreversible damage like muscular atrophy or pulmonary fibrosis. There are, uh, uh, the, the, these are rare disease, many times present in young patients, and uh, uh, the prognosis could be dependent by the first therapeutic option. It is important to discuss a tailored therapy in each case with the expert, and Anakin Parr is one of those. I am sure that Anakin Parr uh, know the last news about myositis, I think so, and uh, we will learn a lot in these sessions. Please, Anna, the word is with you. So, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the presentation as well. Um, so, uh, I wasn't counting on speaking today. So, those of you who are expecting uh, a lecture on tailored therapy of myositis won't have it. So, as I, I've learned from kind of half an hour ago that I was going to talk, I uh, try to uh, get my last presentation on myositis, which is not about tailored therapy, I repeat, but it will be the best that I can do with this uh, time of notice that I was going to talk. So uh, it will mainly be the clinical update on uh, myositis. And then we can discuss at the end some things about more specific about therapy. Okay, so idiopathic inflammatory myopathies, uh, for short, uh, myositis, are uh, actually rare diseases, as Dr. Zhuang already said. Uh, and because they are rare, it is important to uh, differential diagnosis. And uh, as a consequence, there's usually a delay, uh, a huge delay in the diagnosis for uh, most of the patients. Um, but they are rare, but they uh, cause a significant uh, morbidity. Uh, with uh, this dysfunction uh, and the functional limitation uh, for the patients. And uh, actually they reduce life expectancy and the survival on the last reports um, at five years after the diagnosis uh, is about 60%, which is much, much slower than the, most of the other autoimmune diseases uh, right now. Uh, but it's not only about muscle, myositis is not only about muscle, they, actually they are systemic diseases. And in some cases, the extra muscular or, or skin 
organic involvement may be the form of presentation, uh, particularly the lung can be the form of, of presentation of these diseases. Uh, so we should be aware of, of this and, and thought and think about myositis when we see, um, for example, uh, interstitial lung disease. Um, and uh, in the last years, the discovery of some uh, autoantibodies, specific autoantibodies, uh, may alert us for some phenotypes that are uh, that are more or less um, homogeneous subsets between the myositis, which is are which are actually a, a, a group of, of diseases and not one single disease. So, in talking about this and, and phenotypes and and the classification. Um, this is one of the classifications of, of myositis. There, there are a lot of them. Uh, this is the one uh, I prefer. Uh, and actually, it divides the, the myositis into several uh, subgroups. Um, and they are together because they share some clinical phenotypes, some clinical characteristics, and some uh, autoantibodies uh, which uh, prone the patients to, 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 have, to have involvement, organic involvement uh, specific to those, to those autoantibodies. So starting for, with the first one, dermatomyositis. Um, of course, the, the skin lesions are the, the, um, the major feature of, of dermatomyositis. They can be more or less uh, specific. Uh, the autoantibodies associated with dermatomyositis are those that you are seeing there. Uh, and um, with a particularity to NXP2 and particularly TIF1 gamma, which are associated to cancer, and these patients need to be follow up and, and screened more closely for, for cancer after the, the diagnosis, particularly if one gamma positive patients. Um, another subset of, of um, uh, myositis and the dermatomyositis, it's the, the amyopathic dermatomyositis, um, which uh, has a, a kind of different lesions. There were ulcerous, ulcerous uh, lesions, very painful. Uh, usually in the dorsum and palmar um, parts of the ends. And, but what actually uh, differs this uh, form of disease, of myositis, it's the interstitial lung disease, which can, can be rapidly progressive and is usually associated with the presence of MDA5 uh, autoantibody. Um, IBM, inclusion body myositis, sporadic inclusion body myositis, uh, it's a little bit different from the others. It is more common in, in men. Um, and usually it is asymmetric and affects the distal uh, segments of the muscle uh, besides the proximal uh, um, muscles. Um, and uh, in the clinics, we can easily uh, see if this is the form of myositis that the patient has uh, by uh, testing the flexors of the, the, the fingers, which are usually affected, or if we see a patient with dysphagia as a, a prominent feature. The, the diagnosis implies a, um, a special characteristic in the biopsy. And more recently, the, this uh, autoantibody, the CN1A, uh, has been discovered and associated with this form of myositis. But this is not a specific autoantibody of myositis. It can also be present in lupus and sugar. OK, immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy usually uh, is associated with very high CK levels, severe revelomyolysis. Uh, usually there are no extra muscle uh, involvement um, and it's particularly uh, difficult to treat. The two autoantibodies that are associated with this subset of myositis are the SRP and the HMGCR. Um, and um, this is uh, important because the, the treatment could differ uh, if the one or the other is present um, in this form of myositis. And this synthesis syndrome, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a syndrome, it's the more systemic uh, subset of myositis. Um, it is associated when, with one of the, the um, anti-synthetase antibodies that you see there. The most frequent one is JO1, but uh, the, the others are, all can also be, be present. And the, the clinical marker is the interstitial lung disease that is usually associated. Um, and one sign of, of, of prognosis and one sign of, of interstitial lung disease involvement um, is the presence of um, mechanic ants lesions, as you see in, the, in those pictures there. 
um, the clinical, the classic triad of, of um, antisynthase syndrome is myositis, polyarthritis, and interstitial lung disease. But the, the it can be also be more more systemic, and it may include fever and the mechanic hands that I already referred, and um, a renal uh, phenomenon. But of course, the lung is is what are, um, should uh, worry us, and um, it's the determinant of for the treatment and the aggressiveness of the treatment. The overlap myositis are usually uh, a, a case or a, a picture of myositis associated with overlap with systemic sclerosis, uh, majorly, uh, but also sugar and lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, usually it's, um, uh, it's a form of myositis with more extramuscular involvement, uh, particularly with arthritis, interstitial lung disease, and sometimes dysphagia and uh, cytopenias. Um, and um, usually it bears a worse prognosis. These patients with overlap myositis, when they have um, lung involvement, usually uh, evolve more rapidly to lung fibrosis and uh, they respond uh, less to, to treatment, to immunosuppressive treatment. And finally, finally polymyositis. Uh, this is a, an old paper from Antonio Mato but that I, is still very actual, uh, in which he includes polymyositis in the group of unicorns and dragons. And that's pretty much actual, and, and, um, uh, and um, polymyositis, it's actually residual right now. And most of the patients with polymyositis, when we go and see and, and investigate them better, what they have is an antisynthase syndrome, and some of them uh, immune necrotizing myopathy. So I think it, it will it will be residual, and maybe it will disappear this this uh, subset. Okay, the new classification criteria um, published in two, 2017 by uh, Ingrid Lundberg um, tried to actualize the 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 previous classification criteria, uh, which were from 1975, um, and um, they actually, um, they arrange a system of score um, and um, included more or less the same parameters of, uh, of, the, that of the previous uh, classification, but uh, giving them uh, differential importance and, uh, and so a different score to each of them. Um, it's the one that it should be used for, to include patients in trials, in clinical trials, Fortunately, it has a calculator, an online calculator. We only have to tick the what patient has, and it, it gives uh, the final score as having or not myositis. And in some cases, it can usually it can also tell us uh, in which subgroup of myositis the patient is included. But there are uh, several uh, flaws uh, of this um, classification criteria. Uh, one of them is these. Um, very, very specific, but has a low sensitivity. Uh, it only includes one of the myositis specific antibodies, anti-JO1, anti when we have a lot of them now present. Um, and the lung involvement is not included. So those patients which start with only lung involvement cannot be, are not included in this, in this uh, classification criteria. So it is for clinical trials and not for uh, practical practice, uh, daily practice. News on biomarkers. Um, this is a, a very interesting um, original uh, article, which uh, actually the, the objective was to stratify the immune profile of patients with, with myositis uh, and try to see if the uh, immune profile was different somehow between the subsets. What they found uh, is that uh, actually in dermatomyositis in adults, uh, it appears to be a T cell signature and uh, mediated by Th17 cells and with a huge IL-6 production. The polymyositis in adults appears to be more mediated by B cells um, and no increase in IL-6 production. And the juvenile uh, part of the dermatomyositis, it is also appears to be triggered by a B cell signature and no TH17 uh, signature, no increase in IL-6. And this is important because we, we can try to adjust the therapy 
to to these uh, different um, signatures in the immune system. Uh, reviewing the last uh, inflammatory um, mediators related to uh, myositis. Uh, so, uh, as I already said, there appears to be different patterns of interference signatures between the, the subsets. Uh, it appears to be a, a particular involvement of the axis of IL-23 TH17 in the, in the initial phase of the, of the disease. And IL-18 appears to be correlated with the pulmonary involvement and with disease activity. So uh, maybe both of these could be targets for future treatments. Typhoon gamma. Uh, Typhoon gamma is actually redundant in, the, in, the, in our organism. It appears in, in a lot of, of, of tissues um, and it has a significant physiological role particularly in the cell differentiation and, and the proliferation and in the methodic uh, process, but, uh, and also, sorry, and also in the immune response. Uh, but it also has, uh, uh, which is physiological, but it's uh, an important role in controlling the, the tumorogenesis. So this is a molecule that, that we have normally and abundantly in the organism. Uh, and what these authors uh, found was that if when there is a, a normal immune response, the T1 gamma is uh, present in the, in the tumor cells, is one of the ways that, that the immune system has to detect cancer, and it mediates this to 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 eradicate the tumor. But in some cases, there is an ineffective response, and what happens is that the tumor cells that which express aberrant uh, Typhoon gamma, they are not uh, controlled, they proliferate, and uh, um, the anti tumor reaction occurs also against the native Typhoon gamma. Um, and this is uh, what this author thinks that mediates the lesion of the organs with more uh, expression of native Typhoon gamma, which are the skin and the muscles. And uh, uh, it can be uh, the answer why. These patients, some of patients with tumors have perineoplastic um, dermatomyositis. Um, the presence of this autoantibody, besides tumor alert, it also bears the, they also bear a specific cutaneous phenotype, which can alert us for the presence of the autoantibody if we don't, even if we don't have the it uh, ready in the in the blood test. Uh, usually there's extensive cutaneous involvement with pulmonary hypercortotic papules and psoriasis like uh, lesions. She's very specific for the presence of this antibody. The, the physiopathology of paranoplastic dermatomyositis appears to be this cross reactivity between the native and the aberrant T1 gamma. And uh, it can actually be uh, useful as a biomarker in adults with dermatomyositis um, because it is estimated that around 84% uh, of patients with this antibody will develop or will have uh, cancer. The presence of this anti autoantibody, of course, it implies a more uh, frequent malignancy screen in adults, because in the juvenile, it's not associated with, with, with the malignancy. On the other side of, of the, another aspect of TIF1 gamma is that if we can use it as a marker of disease activity. Um, these authors um, retrospectively analyzed uh, what happened uh, if the levels of the antibodies, anti t gamma antibodies became negative or persistent, persisted positive. And what they found is that when it becomes negative, actually the patients achieve high remission, higher remission rates, and uh, they are uh, more uh, respond uh, respond more to, to treatment, they, ha they have less mortality. On the other side, if the titers of uh, these antibodies persist positive, usually there's a, this is associated with a refractory disease and a higher mortality. So it appears that the, the, the titers of this antibody can be used for us to um, modulate the treatment or to, to see when we can uh, lower the immunosuppressive therapy or, or not. Um, regarding interstitial lung disease, um, this group, it's not a group, <laughs> it was written by only by one person, 
but uh, I believe it was it's a group that has um, worked on this. Uh, try to find poor prognostic factors in the interstitial lung disease associated with myopathies and uh, with an extensive review of the literature. And what they found was that some of the bad prognostic factors of this uh, involvement appear to be the acute or subacute form, an older age at the diagnosis, the uh, respiratory dysfunction at the diagnosis, of course, the presence of the anti-MBA5 um, antibody, and the uh, uh, elevation of the inflammatory markers, systemic inflammatory markers, or uh, low FVC at lung function tests at the, the diagnosis. Okay, and now cancer screening in myositis, which is always very uh, debated. Should we treat them, screen them all the same, or should we adjust the screening uh, pending some, some characteristics? Um, so this paper reviews actually, actually the risk factors and if we can use them to try and adjust the screening to the risk of the patient develop, developing a, a malignancy in time. And what they found, that what they used was, was um, stratification based on the disease type, based on, on some clinical characteristics and in serology. And at the end, they proposed uh, um, a scheme, a screening uh, for the screening of malignancy in these patients according to their risk of, for development of uh, malignancy. So by disease, of course, the higher risk is are the patients with dermatomyositis and at an intermediate risk, amyopathic dermatomyositis and polymyositis and the other subsets with uh, a low risk for developing uh, malignancy. For clinical stratification, the risk factors found were advanced stage at the diagnosis, a male gender, uh, the presence of dysphagia, some um, features of cutaneous lesions, like with vasculitis or ulceration, uh, and a rapid and aggressive onset of the disease, the refractoriness to, to treatment, um, and uh, elevated inflammatory parameters or elevated CK levels. But they also found protective factors. Uh, and these appear to be the presence of interstitial lung disease, arthritis, and the renal phenomenon, which is usually associated with that disease syndrome, which was already by the disease a, 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 low, a low risk. And they stratify like this, high risk, the presence of multiple risk factors and no protective factors, and intermediate risk, one to two risk factors, um, and presence of protective factors, and low risk, the others, so no risk factors and one or more. Uh, protective risk factors. And finally, the serology. So for the high risk, the presence of anti-T1 gamma and or anti-NXP2. Uh, the intermediate risk, the presence of anti-HMG um, CR or anti-SAA or negativity for myositis-specific um, antibodies and the other um, antibodies associated with a low risk. So they mixed all this together and they came with this uh, diagram, which is a proposal for, for the follow-up, not for diagnosis. At diagnosis, all patients should be screened for, for cancer, uh, independently of the age. And after the and in the first three years after diagnosis, uh, they should have a screening uh, which should be regular. But after that, we can um, actually uh, try to adapt the follow-up for, for screening, malignancy screening, with the risk of the patient to develop um, malignancy. So if we have a patient but each belongs to the low risk category, we can uh, actually do a clinical history and physical examination, um, the, the, the no basic um, blood tests, and uh, then the screening based according to age and based on the national recommendations. For the intermediate risk, we should add to this basic screening um, a thoracic uh, and abdominal and pelvic CT and tumor markers and the gynecological prosthetic ultrasound. And for those with high risk, um, besides the basic and the enhanced uh, screening, we should also uh, include um, a PET scan for, for follow-up of this. Uh, patients um, with respect to malignancy. 
therapy, therapy and strategies. Uh, this group uh, evaluated the, um, the efficacy of subcutaneous immunoglobulins in, in these patients. What they saw is that uh, the subcutaneous uh, immunoglobulins appear to be um, uh, uh, very efficacious at uh, muscle involvement with a complete remission uh, in most of the patients, uh, also for continuous involvement and for gastrointestinal or esophagic involvement with all with good response in mo most of the patients. For the cardiac involvement, it doesn't appear to be very, very effective. Also, the, uh, actually the patients progressed with disease, um, the most of the patients progressed with disease and two of them die. For the pulmonary involvement, there's, there was improvement in the minority of the patients, but there was a stabilization in most of them. And for the articular benefit, um, only a partial, a partial, a partial um, involvement. So the conclusion appears to be that uh, immunoglobulin should be used, and it is particular, particularly uh, effective in muscle cutaneous and esophageal involvements, and it appears to stabilize the progression of uh, lung involvement. Um, this is a, a recent uh, article um, from Lundberg, um, which approaches the, the management of refractory inflammatory myopathy. So those patients which do not respond to the first line, sorry, to the first line therapy, which is uh, for her in this article, steroids and one uh, immunosuppressive therapy, or at least three months of, of duration. So first alert, when we have a refractory disease, before calling it a refractory disease, we should do a rescreening of, of malignancy and sometimes review the diagnosis. When we are not treating the right uh, disease, that's why patients are not responding. When, if actually we have a refractory uh, myositis, um, well, it, it depends a little bit on the involvements that we, we have. And when we have continuous involvements, um, immunoglobulin or rituximab are both uh, very effective. And if we do not have a, do not have a response to this, uh, consider a JAK inhibitor. When we do have, uh, we do not have a skin rash, or we do have a skin rash, but we have some particular autoantibodies, uh, this can also differ on our choice for, for the treatment. Meaning if we have uh, anti, an anti-synthetase uh, antibody uh, or an anti-SRP, this SRP is associated with immune necrotizing myopathy, we can consider rituximab. Um, and if the patient doesn't respond, uh, well, you probably add immunoglobulin or change for batacept. When we have uh, HMG-CR, also immune mediated uh, necrotizing myopathy, but with a different antibody, this subset appears to respond better to immunoglobulin, and this should be the first choice after refractorness. Um, and if the patient doesn't respond, maybe add, uh, adding we can add rituximab or uh, change for for uh, abatacept. And if the main problem is dysphagia, we should go straight to immunoglobulin, which appears to be uh, very effective in this involvement. About interstitial lung disease, when it is uh, associated with inflammatory myopathies, actually more or less 40% of the patients will have or have already uh, interstitial lung disease involvement. Um, the great majority has um, a specific autoantibodies associated, uh, most of them uh, in the group of the anti-synthetase antibodies. Um, but the presence of the MDA5 uh, is actually associated with high mortality. Um, 30 to 40 percent in the first year, particularly in the, in the first six months of the diagnosis. And when we have uh, an interstitial lung disease that presents in an acute or subacute for form, uh, it also bears a, a, a bad, a bad a worse prognosis with a low five year survival of uh, more, uh, little more than, than half of the patients. So, based on this, uh, there were a lot of groups trying to different strategies to, to treat these this, uh, diseases. One of them was, the, is, is, it was um, described in this paper, 
And what they used is was from the beginning in the presence of anti-MVA5 um, uh, antibodies and interstitial lung disease, which uh, was not, uh, which was not um, uh, responsive to, to steroids at the first place. What they did is that they, they, they divided the patients into two subgroups. In the first patient, they, they did what we usually do, which is to add an immunosuppressive therapy to steroids. And on the other half, no. The other half, which is the, the line in, in, uh, at the top, what they, did, what they did was from the beginning, the combined and potent immunosuppressive therapy and besides steroids, cyclophosphamide and tepolins. And as you see, the survival was um, very different between the two groups. This other group also we anti MBA5 um, interstitial lung disease actually um, added tofacitinib to the to the immunosuppressive therapy, and the difference was also uh, significant in terms of, of survival. Uh, and at six months, uh, the 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 numbers were very different between the add-on tofacitinib group and the um, uh, co compared with the control group of, of patients. Okay, this, um, uh, it, I will already refer this paper, which were, uh, was analyzing the factors of bad prognosis associated with interstitial lung disease. And actually they've divided not by um, autoantibodies at the beginning, but by the form of presentation. Uh, between chronic form and the rapidly progressive or subacute form, which um, they recommend to be treated more aggressively from the beginning, uh, adding um, um, tacrolimus or cyclosporine to the high dose of, of uh, prednisolone. And if there is a presence of the anti MDA5 antibody, um, add the, to this um, intravenous cyclophosphine appears to be the best strategy when all of these bad prognostic factors are, are present. Uh, Lundberg uh, presented a, a little bit different uh, uh, strategy, uh, not by the formal presentation, but the severity. And the severity here includes the extension of the pulmonary involvement uh, in the CT and, uh, and also the, the, the presence of uh, some autoantibodies. And our proposal is to add from the beginning, if we have a severe interstitial lung disease, to add cyclophosphamide or cyclophosphamide, uh, mycophenolate and rituximab to these patients from the beginning. Uh, and if they do not improve, combine rituximab and cyclophosphamide. So very severe and potent immunosuppressive when the forms of presentation are very severe. So I'm almost finishing. Statin use, can we use statin in these patients? Should we use it? When to use them? Okay, this, um, this is a, a more or less recent paper. It includes uh, a low number of patients, only 33 patients, but it's something. And uh, these uh, 33 patients all have, uh, all have um, one form of the myositis, and they all have a high medium risk score for atherosclerotic diseases. At, at 10 years, so they actually needed um, to, to be initiated in statin. And what they did when they associated statin was uh, what they found out is that they were very good tolerated without um, a recurrence of, or, of myositis if these patients did not have anti-HMG coenzyme A antibodies. Um, and it, they appear to be statin use appear to be safer if the patient is in a low disease activity or with the, the disease in remission. So we can use them, uh, but we need to be cautious with the use of statin in, in these patients. So finishing. Um, okay, inflammatory myopathies are actually rare. It, it's, a, it's the group of, of diseases, not one disease, and they are very heterogeneous um, between them. Uh, which makes it hard to have trials with this statistical power. 
um, the characterization, the, the ultimate characterization using the, the, the new autoantibodies uh, came to clarify subsets of, of patients with similar disease progression and, and response to, to treatment. Uh, but we still need biomarkers um, involved in the pathophysiology to try to rationalize follow-up and try to tailor the therapy approach uh, with the actually immune dysregulation that these um, patients have. And uh, of course, the, the, the objective is to reduce the morbid mortality of these patients, which is still very high if we compare with other systemic diseases like lupus or, or Sjogren's syndrome. So we see that uh, an acampar give to us uh, uh, the tailored therapy and a lot of more. <laughs> yes, I learned a lot uh, I expect before. So we have uh, 10 minutes to the questions. Yes, there. Yeah. It's a Thank you for the nice overview. Do you have any idea what kind of assays have been used for the antibody detection in the different studies? In my experience, most research group use immunoprecipitation, while the clinical laboratories use uh, line blood assays or dot blood assays. And in particular for TIF1 gamma, there are serious concerns about the, the specificity and sensitivity of this antibody on the line bloods. So can you comment on that? Yeah, you, you, thank you. Uh, you're quite right. Um, actually, the, the tests are very different between different laboratories. Um, uh, usually, the, what I see from most of the studies, uh, it's the, the immunoblot, uh, the uromyositis immunoblot that is used, but it's not transversal. Uh, some, some groups use uh, another different, uh, different techniques to, to, to detect these autoantibodies. And th that is actually a problem because I don't know if we are comparing the same patients. Uh, yeah, we should try to universalize the, the, the techniques, but you're right. Uh, here, when we have um, a result like, um, and we, we do have sometimes, a lot of times that, uh, um, a result for one of these specific autoantibodies that is weakly positive, we usually repeat it. And in our experience, most of the times it is um, it is a false positive. Another question? Yeah. Thank you, Anna. There is no tailored therapy without all you have said before, indeed. So tell me, uh, do you think, or are you aware of any trial with an ifrolumab in those patients with myositis and uh, interferon signature? An ifrolumab, yeah, yes, there, there's a big trial, which is not specifically for myositis, but includes a lot of systemic diseases that I think is still ongoing. It was uh, stopped. Uh, well, it wasn't stopped. It was quiescent uh, for, for a long time. Uh, but now I think they are already again, re recruiting patients, but it's not for myositis uh, specifically, it's for uh, a big group of, of systemic autoimmune diseases. Why, why not? Yeah, 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 myositis is becoming like uh, scleroderma, uh, <laughs> which we have to try everything and see if one of them works. Another question? No. One of them. Uh, the Lange involvement uh, in the spectrum of the disease is uh, bad news. Uh, so today, what you do with the patient with the Lange involvement uh, in the beginning? Okay, that's a good question. Yes, Lange involvement, it's, it's a factor of, of bad prognosis in these patients. Uh, and most of the times it's silent um, for a, a lot of years before, before we can detect it. Um, for me, it is a, a factor that um, implicates in, in my therapy of choice. 
Um, and if the patient has a long involvement from the, the beginning uh, for first approach, uh, well, it depends on, on the, the rapidity of the, um, of the involvement. And if the patient already has um, an interference in lung function tests, but for a uh, first approach, I usually uh, put the patient on a tacrolimus. Lauren, no? No questions? No? Another question, uh, a little out of the, of the box. Uh, what is uh, the, the role of the physiatric treatment in these patients and when we must start it? Okay, direct uh, response from the day one of diagnosis. Um, physical exercise, it's as important as or more important than the pharmacological therapy in these patients. Of course, we cannot start uh, with a marathon, that's not, but it is important to start from the beginning. And why? The pharmacological, it's what I explain to patients although I'm, they are usually not very convinced, but uh, the, the, the pharmacological therapy, it, it is used to, to, to abolish or to diminish the inflammation, but the exercise, it's actually what's going to maintain and recover the muscle. So it is important that we start from day one. Uh, a few years ago, few, no, not, not few, some years ago, it was said that because the muscle was inflamed, we shouldn't uh, force it. Uh, but that has been reviewed by several groups, and actually the exercise should be started as soon as the diagnosis is uh, made, adapted to the, the, the deficit of muscle strength, of course. But passive, at least passive physical therapy, it's, it can be, can be started immediately, and then they will progress on, on the treatment, on the physical treatment. Yes, Marinho? Direct question for steroids as you know as we know also know steroids are very important at the beginning of disease but they're also very toxic in, yeah, for muscle how do you manage steroids in these patients do you keep uh, the one milligram per kilo the first months as uh, the oldest strategies or you start to taper before or use uh, another strategy just for think on that Okay, yeah, steroids. Steroids are, are actually toxic for the muscle, uh, and we, we tend to use lower doses and for, a lo for, for less time. Uh, how do we do this in, in practice, or how do I do? I usually prefer to give patients a boluses in the, in the beginning, bolus or methylprednisolone, lower boluses, but boluses, and then start with half of the dose, not one milligram per kilo, but half milligram per kilo, and try to taper it um, a little bit faster than in other, in other patients. And of course, to do that, we need to start from the diagnosis an immunosuppressive. So, because otherwise we're not going to, to control the, the disease. And the aim should be at six months, no steroids. But it's not usually, it's not sometimes not, <laughs> Very good questions from Marie, you know? You yeah, yeah, yeah. So? yeah. Another question? All right. I think that uh, we must uh, go on to the uh, nation. It was nice to be here with you. And uh, I learned a lot with Anna Kampar. It's always a pleasure to be with you. So we'll move on.
it's the next section. Um, first of all, uh, I have to thank the kind invitation of Dr. Carlos Diaz and Professor Carlos Vasconcelos to be here. It's also a pleasure to be co-shared with Dr. Tomás Fonseca and to be in this round table with Professor Laurent Arnaud and um, Professor Matteo Piga. So in this round table, we'll talk a little bit about technology, the apps that can help us in dealing with some patients and in improving uh, the relationship between the doctor and the patient. So we will start with Professor Laurent Arnaud. All of us know Professor Laurent Arnaud is a great friend of Portuguese guys, has been with us lots of times recently in Madeira, now in Porto. So it's a pleasure uh, to present Professor Laura Arnaud. It's a professor in rheumatology. It works uh, at Strasbourg in France. Um, it's a member of the University Hospitals of Strasbourg, the French National Reference for Rare Autoimmune Diseases, and is now the elected president of the European Society of Lupus. So it's a pleasure, Professor Laura Arnaud. Um, thank you very much. Um, actually, I have two introductions. One is from the heart and one is from the brain. Uh, so from my heart, I would like to say thank you very much uh, to Carlos Vasconcelos, Carlos Diaz, Antonio Marino. But to many of you, I know by your first name and I can call my friends. And I'm quite proud of that, actually. I've been invited here every year for the last, I think, 14 years or 13. I've lost the count. Uh, so I'm feeling very, very honored and privileged to be here. And from the brain, it's very different, uh, is uh, the fact that digital uh, world is invading our life. I have a digital uh, watch. Uh, who did not use uh, Google uh, Map this year? I think everybody uses Google App. So these technologies are infiltrating our life and they are also infiltrating medicine. It's been five years. We're talking about digital medicine, and I'm just going to ask whether this is a dream or whether this is a nightmare. And uh, I know you like uh, clinics, you like to see patients. It's the same for me. And I'm going to describe you a world without doctors. Uh, you will tell me if you like it or not. So these are my disclosures. And uh, maybe I'd like to start by the global care of lupus patients. There are several great lupus sessions during the meeting. One is just after us. Uh, we have to control disease activity, prevent damage, and use limited amount of corticosteroids. But obviously, there are lifestyle interventions, which are super important. And maybe this is something we can give to computer or to applications. This is an open question. Uh, we've had a lot of feedbacks from the patients, this is a big survey by the uh, Patient Association, Lupus Europe, more than 5,000 uh, patients uh, answered actually. Uh, and you see that they gave us feedback about the impact on their life, the impact over their career, over their life. So we have to improve this. And I'm going to take you a bit further in time. There will be little science, a bit of a futuristic view, but you will tell me what you think. And we are going to talk about Christina, She's 26 years old, and she's the head of social media of a very big company called Lugal. And it's been a few months. She's been complaining of inflammatory joint pain in the hands, in the wrist, and she also complains of photosensitivity. So what is she going to do? She's going to do an online pre-diagnosis. It already exists. You go to uh, websites such as whatismydiagnosis.com, you enter your age, you enter uh, your family history. There's a case of rheumatoid arthritis in the family. You enter your sign, you press on diagnosis, and you see that the computer tells us that she has 87% of un unfortunate genes to have an inflammatory rheumatism. Uh, she's a young woman, so it's likely to be an autoimmune disease, and that she has a 64 probability to have systemic lupus. And unfortunately, I think this is actually true. Um, so what is she going to do uh, with this high uh, probability of uh, autoimmune disease? What do you think she's going to do? Go to a doctor. But first, because she's the head of social media, she's going to track her symptoms on the telephone. She does not want to go to the consultation without anything. So she's tracking the stress, the energy, the pain. 
And you probably know there are already more than 100 uh, applications on the telephone which enables you to do that. So she's tracking and she has to find a doctor and we are in 2028, nobody phones the hospital anymore to take appointments, it already works. You take an online appointment. So you select who you're going to see, where you're going to see the doctor. And unfortunately for her, the, the expertise, the closest expertise is actually very far, more than three hour drive, which is very common for patients with rare disease. They have to go to Porto to, to get the expertise actually. And she's going to the consultation, but it's too far. So she's going to do a tele consultation and Matteo Piga will tell you about that just uh, after me actually. And the problem is that she has lots of different things. She has written a beautiful letter. I'm sure you receive beautiful letters occasionally from the patients. Well, she has one. She has lab results. She has radiographs. She has tracked all the symptoms and she will be very happy to show you all the data and uh, how are we going to do that? Because these things, they do not fit together. So we have to solve the problem of the interoperability, different formats that we have to put together in the electronic health record. I don't know how it is in Portugal, but in France, we've been talking about that for 25 years, something like that. It still does not work, but we all have a little card, which is super expensive, which is theoretically able to collect all our data, but it does not work. But in 2028, I'm sure it works. And uh, what is really striking on the other side, this is the rheumatologist side, but it can be an internal medicine, is that you have the list of your patients asking for a consultation and you can prioritize them based on what is important for you. Uh, a follow-up of gout, maybe this patient can wait. An acute diagnosis of SLE, maybe you're going to see this patient first. And it sounds really strange, but I've been living in Sweden for one year, and this is the way it works in Sweden today. Nobody is writing a letter to refer you to another department. It's entirely computerized. And in the internal medicine department of uh, Stockholm hospitals, every day they receive a computerized list of patients and they put some flags for the patients they are going to take inside. So this is uh, not a dream or a dystopia, this is daily life in Scandinavia. She's going to do the tea consultation and we are going to say, well, uh, you have a high probability of an autoimmune disease, so you have to do some immune checkup. And in 2028, nobody goes to the lab anymore. You do that by Amazon. You just take a drop of blood on the paper and you send it back by postal mail and you receive your lab results later just with a little drop of blood and this works now there are some uh, companies selling softwares and application you can measure in a drop of blood more than 100 markers and of course you know uh, the feedback from the patients when they receive their results they say i understand nothing this is not understandable so we are in 2028 and everything is color based. You see that the patient, well, she has a normal CRP, which is quite normal during a lupus flare, except in some cases. She has very high anti-nuclear antibodies, high double-stranded DNA antibodies, low C3. So obviously she has a profile of lupus. So based on that, we will confirm the diagnosis of systemic lupus in this patient. And the feedback we got from the patient is that when the diagnosis is announced, there's a very high psychological suffering. They want to talk, they want some feedback on the disease. And it's the case in France, but I think it's the case in Portugal. There's a disequilibrium between the demand for psychological support and the offer of psychologists, which are very scarce. And I would say psychologists trained in autoimmune disease or in disease, they're actually very, very uncommon. So the answer, of course, is chatbots. So have you, do you know what a chatbot is? No, you don't know? Uh, it's, it's a, you go on a website and you talk to the computer. And in France, it's used for the national comp company to, to sell uh, the, the train tickets. Where do you want to go? You type the name and the computer say, hello, I, I am giving you a ticket. This is how it works. So, hello, I am Psycholoop, the chatbot developed to help SLE patients. How are you today? Well, I'm still smiling, but actually I'm not so good. 
well, at least you can smile. I can't smile with my floppy this face. And uh, well, okay, so uh, today it does not work, but I'm sure in 2028 it will work. Or maybe not, I don't know actually. Then the patient should enter a, a patient training program. Uh, who has education program in your center? Can you just raise your hand? Okay, we're from the same center, so this is Renaud Fetter. Okay, um, so the patient, they come to our department and we give them like little classes for the patients that are grouped by five, but again, they have to come. And in 2028, you can do this at home. You just answer questions. Do you know anything about photo protection? Do you know about pregnancy? And then based on your background, you don't teach uh, people who did not go to school the same as someone with academic degrees. It should be adapted. Uh, you, based on what the people know, based on their needs, you are not going to train for pregnancy a male with lupus. Uh, so you will deliver some small videos, online concepts uh, for a personalized education plan. And that's probably the future. Then we've been discussing this this morning, that this is what this meeting is about, is personalized therapy. I was discussing with Antonio this morning. Uh, there's the traditional model of medicine. Today, we are trying to do stratified medicine based on is this a man, is this a, a female, uh, is, is this an immunopositive rheumatoid arthritis, but this is very basic. And we know we are ho hoping for new biomarkers, which will enable to predict which treatment should be used in a given patient, but that's the future. Currently, we don't have that. Then there's the treatment part. And it's the same. Uh, let me ask you a question. I'm sure you've been in the USA. Where do you get your medicine in the USA? In the supermarket, absolutely. So there's a tendency now, which is called digital pharmacy, which is you get your medicine like validated by a pharmacist, but it's delivered to your home. In France, you cannot do that. It's strictly regulated. I think it's the same in Portugal. But in the States, you can actually order your medicines, not on fake websites, on real websites from pharmacy, and you get them at home. And what is interesting is that most packaging can now include little chips or QR codes to get some interesting information. You scan the box and you get the leaflet, you got some advice. You can even know if the patient has taken the treatment. We know that uh, when we ask the patient, did you actually take your treatment? There's a memory bias. There's also patients who pretend taking and they don't take. This is very common in chronic disease. Well, there are some um, startups that have developed application which can first check if you are the correct person, if you take the correct pill, and if you actually took it or if you pre pretended to take it. And if the sequence is not completed, there's an alarm on the telephone for all the, the, the relatives, for patients with dementia, for instance, this can be very interesting. You know that the main complaint of patients with autoimmune disease is fatigue. That's very striking, but it comes number one in lupus, even before joint pain. And there are applications uh, for fatigue based on virtual reality, augmented reality. We have an intern doing uh, his uh, medical thesis on hypnosis for pain based on the virtual reality. So this is coming in our life. You may like it or not, but it's coming. And finally, there's something really extraordinary, which is digital therapeutics. I don't know if you've heard about this concept before. It's a treatment that is delivered by an application because it's a treatment, it's licensed by the FDA. The effect has to be proven in a randomized controlled trial, and it is prescribed and reimbursed by the healthcare system in the US. And it covers broad fields, which can be of interest to us, uh, weight loss, smoking cessation, chronic pain, back pain, sleep, anxiety, depression. And these are validated treatments by the FDA. They have been randomized control trials. The patient may enter a digital uh, control trial. You know about classical trials. There's a lot of problems. You have to recruit the patient. You have to check whether they have the inclusion criteria, the exclusion criteria. It's time consuming. Maybe we don't think about everything. 
we are discussing every morning, uh, does this patient can fit in a trial? This can be done electronically, like automatic matching. The patient can fill in TROs at home and you can have these digital endpoints. And finally, we will have to follow up the patient using what is called wearables, such as the watch. And you know, you can track the vitals, but also the joint pain, the UV light, which is interesting for lupus patient. Do I have to apply sunscreen, extra sunscreen today, fatigue treatments and physical activity? So this is the fully digital pathway of a future lupus patient. Uh, I'm not sure this is what we are really hoping for, but unfortunately, I think this is arriving and we have to do with it because it's probably going to be either we are interested in this and we involve ourselves in this, either it's coming and we have to take it. Uh, if you're interested by this, you can read this paper we wrote with the team. And I just wanted to say thank you very much. Muito obrigado. Does someone have a question for Laurent? But just to make it clear, I'm not telling you that we should not see our patients. That's just that. Yeah, what's the role 20, of the 28? What is the role of the doctor? What's the role of the doctor? Actually, there are different stakeholders. I've talked about the patient perspective, but the doctor, uh, it's a good question. I, I think it, it can be very bad, but th there are some good things. For instance, do we really have to see often patients with very stable disease? If we are very busy, and I know in Portugal, you are seeing many, many patients at the consultation. Do you really see patients which are fully stabilized just to renew the prescription? Maybe we should first see patients who have high disease activity and maybe they can be identified or prioritized through this. This could be an option. I have a question for you, Laurent. As we are talking on the morning, I think it will be a little bit different between the north of Europe and the south of Europe mm -hmm. as we're talking on the morning. Uh, in the south of Europe and in Portugal, we have a strong relationship between the doctor and the patient. And I have a lot of patients that uh, that told me, uh, I will take the pills that you gave to me. So yes. you decide. We have a lot of patients of, of that kind. So I think, and my question is, what apps and this uh, scheme that you present mm -hmm. to us, how can it be different in different countries, in North of Europe, in South of Europe, what do you think about that? What I really think is that it's going to be like that in the US because it's a paid uh, health system and the big pharmaceutical companies and also the, the labs, uh, I'm thinking Google's, are putting a lot of pressure to develop applications that are going to be used because they are licensed and reimbursed. Uh, and then I think it will make it, us feel strange because everywhere in the US, people will have these techniques and we won't have them. And I think bit by bit, maybe later, 10 years later, 15 years later, it will come in our life. It's true for many things actually, but I think it will infiltrate health and uh, either we are involving ourselves to try to, to reshape this to what is good for us, either it's just there. Thank you, Laurent. Uh, what will make us different from machines? Is there a chance that an artificial uh, intelligence algorithm will replace our role as doctors in seven years, but maybe in 20 years? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is an interesting question. Can artificial intelligence replace the doctor? Uh, it's a question which is asked in many, many fields. Uh, this is also true for plane uh, traffic control, actually. Now, artificial intelligence is, is there and the air traffic controller is only validating the results. You probably know that, but it's also true for neurology and MRI in some cases, when you can have automated measurement. Well, I think we should involve in this, but I also think that we could have a role of 
validation of expertise of difficult cases and the rest, what is more normal, more simple, can be managed automatically. I can, I'm almost certain that for CT scans, for instance, the radiologist will have a tag, which is, this is a normal CT scan, up, or it's an abnormal CT scan, and then the radiologist will have to validate the problem. And maybe it will be something like that for us, but this is the future, unfortunately, I'm not certain. <laughs> Thank you, Laurent, for the this perspective. It's uh, it's quite uh, yes. I, I was wondering uh, on two just two things. One is uh, how we can we can manage that with the protection data, mm -hmm. and uh, because I think that, that the laws are fighting these things. Uh, one is one of the problems, and yes. the other is. Should we, the doctors, uh, with our association, start to do that, and not allowing to everyone to do it? Or should we start now this kind of strategy, mm -hmm. and to be uh, to be have the power or, and the and the, the rule of these strategies, and not any kind of enterprise that can uh, do everything? I think these are two just questions. a thought. I don't know. One question is about medical ethic, data protection. This is a very crucial uh, thing. In France, we have cases of uh, uh, personal health data from private uh, clinics being outed to the public uh, with the ability to see name by name the disease by the person. This is a catastrophe. So there's a big challenge for data protection, and I would say extra data protection because these are very sensitive data. So we have to hope that computer specialists will find uh, good solutions. Uh, then your, your second question is about the, you said, sorry. Yeah. I, I think we should engage in this. If I had to do a PhD now, I would do a PhD about that uh, because I, I think that computer specialists can, can build apps and so on. But I think it's really important to have the doctor perspective. And uh, yeah, I, I think this is very sensitive. As a doctor, I would definitely take part to this. And actually, we are. Uh, Renaud we say, is developing chatbots for rheumatoid arthritis and spondylarthritis. arthritis. So, thank you, Laura. Thank you. And I will ask uh, for a comment from you. Looking at the literature, the quality, the quality of evidence is very low. Mm -hmm. So, do you think we are moving too fast in the direction of digital medicine? So the, the question is about the, the level of evidence of these techniques. There are different things. For digital therapeutics, you have to go through a fully randomized uh, controlled trial validated by the FDA. The level of evidence is very good, but it's very limited. For the rest, it's the same. Uh, do we have good data about standard medical education programs? We don't. Uh, I think we'll have to develop these, th these things to test them in very good ways and show whether they work and they do not work. But now we don't have so much good evidence for sure. Look, one question I, I, I was thinking a lot of, um, in our presentation and um, I like a lot the relationship between doctor and mm -hmm. patient. And uh, psychi psychiatrists had lots of work on the same drug prescribed for different doctors mm -hmm. at uh, different effects. Yes. So I think if um, a patient receive uh, a drug from uh, her or his, pay, his doctor or another one, mm -hmm. it has different effects. What do you think about that and the digital era uh, on that? I, I think it's difficult to say. I'm certain that the medical patient doctor relationship has an influence on the course of the disease. I'm certain of that. But what is it going to be with a computer application? I don't know. This has to be tested formally, but it can be made in a manner that it simulates an human interaction. This is what chatbots are made for. You have the impression you are talking to a human person, but it's a computer. For now, it's not good, but with intelligence, uh, inter artificial intelligence, the, the quality is really increasing, and you can have a full conversation without realizing you are talking to a computer, actually. Well, well, good discussion. So, uh, Laura, I remember a paper, I used to quote it. Uh, it's uh, from the 
uh, from Alban Feinstein, unfortunately he died some years ago, numbers rather than words. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the beginning of the, the scales, scores that start in America. Mm -hmm. But in the end, after some years, Alban Feinstein recognized that nothing, no scales, no numbers mm -hmm. can replace uh, words and talking. But I want to, to ask you about this, Jesus Christ, PROs, yes. patient report outcomes. Well, I don't know what, what is happening in France, but when I put here mm -hmm. the, a scale, yes. uh, I have to say immediately to the patient, if you put everything in 10, I will stop mm -hmm. the, the 400, 500 euros you are uh, taking pills by the state. So I like this, the computer collects the PROs, but you need to, to give uh, some advice how to, to collect this information, how, do, how, how the patients I, should answer. I agree with you. I'm going to answer a bit differently. There's a technique called a uh, rush model. For each question, you can rank a difficulty. It means that you are able to present the patient with different questions of the same difficulty so that every time the patient has different questions but they are assessing precisely the same thing and so it means that every time the patient can see something different but assessing precisely the same thing and this can be adapted to what the, the patient answered before just uh, one comment uh, Laurent. Yeah. Uh, but I think one of the things that we are talking about the digital, digital era in uh, medicine, mm -hmm. but uh, I think that it's the same in France as in Portugal. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our patients have uh, uh, some issues about uh, illiteracy and, and yes. health issues. So yes. uh, I think it's uh, there is a lot also to 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 make in that area. So so we mm -hmm. can so they can improve and they can use this digital. Mechanism. I fully agree with you. It's called digital literacy. Yeah. Are you able not to use these systems? There's a slight correlation with age, but I think we all know people a bit older, super smart, connecting, going everywhere with a mobile phone. So it's not a strong correlation. I think the new generation, which is really born with the social media, will be fully able to do that. Thank you, Lohan. This is a, a bit of a follow-up question to uh, the comment uh, made by Tomas. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks at the other people, not older people with uh, Ill in digital illiteracy, but uh, children and adolescents. Mm -hmm. So they are, are all used to using mobile phones, apps, um, and we know there are psychological issues related with uh, social media. Uh, when in the future we will have all of these patients using all of these apps, do you think there will be a risk for a psychological burden, uh, a negative one, in addition to the one that already comes with lupus and other autoimmune diseases? And how would you address that? that that's a very uh, fascinating question because we know that all these chronic autoimmune diseases are actually associated with a, a strong burden, psychological burden. So the answer is, can we invert this burden using this app? And will this app generate their own burden? I think the answer is yes and yes, but I think it's just different. Uh, we have to wait, we have to assess this. But I just wanted to remind you that even the treatments we use now, the biologics, some of them are associated with significant suicidality signals in the trials. Antonio, many questions. Sorry, it, uh, it's a, uh, also a comment, but uh, I think this this PROs collection is a, it's a, 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 full, a focal question and. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of diseases and a lot of recommendations are going to to the place of the PROs. I'm not sure that is the good or the best idea, mm -hmm. but I think we have PROs that are mixing things uh, that we cannot measure correctly. I think we should change something about perception related related outcomes and functional related outcomes. Mm -hmm. I think most of them 
mix perception or subjective symptoms with functional symptoms that it's possible to 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 do it correctly and i don't know if we, we maybe we should try to change a little bit that and um i don't know if we are prepared to to start therapies and to improve our dapper therapies based on subjective or perception related outcomes uh, i don't know what is your your idea but yeah. i think we are not we are working with bad patient related outcomes well, yeah i'm just going to answer you there's a very short comment have you never been the doctor of a consultation when you tell your patient everything is absolutely okay and the patients tell you what are you talking about my life is a nightmare i'm not doing well at all and you say yes look everything is okay no that's not okay uh, well thank you very much Muito obrigado. So we, we now go to the second talk of this uh, chair. So uh, we know that telemedicine is emerging to, as a possible tool for reducing uh, the, the risk of contagious and viral spread during COVID-19 pandemic and uh, a, a possible useful strategy for the management of chronic diseases. So to talk about that, we have uh, Professor Matteo Piga that is Associated Professor of Rheumatology at the Department of Medical Science in the, in the University of Cagliari. He has many research in many areas like lupus. Uh, he also has done a, a research fellow in the UK and has a particular interest in the diagnosis and monitoring chronic inflammatory rheumatic diseases with different tools like ultrasound and the focus of today, of course, telemedicine. Thank you very much for the introduction and also Good afternoon to everyone, first of all. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much, Carlos Vasconcelos and Carlos Diaz for this kind of invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Every time I've been in Porto, good things happen to me. So <laughs> really glad to, to be here and also to share this session with uh, uh, Bohan, talking about uh, digital medicine maybe talking about uh, yeah thank you very much about um, digital medicine and my job today is to okay thank you my job today is to uh, discuss the evidence-based telemedicine use uh, in uh, systemic auto autoimmune diseases and have a look of, of uh, what outcome measure we can use in uh, telemedicine for our patients. And finally, we have a, a focus on virtual visiting. Why only a focus on virtual visiting? Because actually uh, we can uh, um, remote delivery a lot of healthcare practice and also a clinical services to our patients. And we can uh, group uh, telemedicine in two big categories. The synchronous one, which are the, mm, those, the category which uh, people think at first uh, talking about uh, telemedicine, which, which require a live interaction between health professional and patients and is meant to offer a virtual alternative to the in-person visit, so virtual consultation. And the second group is asynchronous telemedicine uh, that employ a delayed messaging system between doctors and patients for the delivery of care. And many of the examples that Laurent uh, gave us is about asynchronous uh, medicine. The uh, asynchronous telemedicine could be divided in three groups. The internet-based rehabilitation, which has low diffusion, probably because the high cost technology, and telemonitoring of disease activity, which is quite used in diseases like diabetes or hypertension, when we can easily measure the um, treatment target, such as uh, glycated hemoglobin or blood pressure. 
but it is still not used in uh, uh, or generally generally not used in patients with systemic autoimmune diseases. And we are and we have two randomized control trials for this uh, first two groups of intervention, not more, only two randomized control trials. And the third group, the, which is far more diffused, uh, is represented by self-management program like uh, cognitive behavioral treatment, which uh, has demonstrated to be very effective in patients with fibromyalgia and uh, also kind of uh, chronic pain. Now I have a quick question for you. Um, anyone of you have any experience, have any personal experience, practical experience with, with any of this asynchronous telemedicine approach? Show your hand, please. Nobody has, okay. This is quite uh, usual because the, <laughs> the diffusion of such medicine is not so um, big, especially in Europe. They use it in Canada or in uh, uh, Australia, in the US, where, when they have very um, big country, a lot of kilometers between the specialized center and the territory. So we, they have to fill the gap, um, the distance gap. But uh, in Europe, is, uh, they are not uh, very much diffused. Actually, I have my first experience with telemedicine in 2012 when uh, I was delegated um, from my boss to be the principal investigator for a small randomized control trial, the recovery of movement and telemonitoring technology trial, which is a, a RCT aimed to identify if uh, uh, telemedicine rehabilitation program for the hands in patient with rheumatoid arthritis in remission and in patient with systemic sclerosis is effective and accepted by patients in order to improve the mm, hand function. And we have two groups of patients. Uh, one, the experimental arm, who performed the um, rehabilitation using, using this prototypal uh, device, which was a uh, uh, developed by the bioengineers in my university, and the control arm who performed a, a simple uh, rehabilitation program with uh, uh, occupational exercise using common object that you can find at home, uh, like a coin or a, a small bottle. And uh, the patients have to perform the rehabilitation, the mm, telemedicine rehabilitation using this uh, device, and I was allowed to uh, check for the compliance with the exercise program and also with the effectiveness of the exercise program using this um, web-based web platform. And the results were that uh, systemic, uh, in both systemic sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis, patients in the experimental arm have better hand function than in the control arm. That was main because uh, uh, a higher compliance, not because it's better to perform the rehabilitation using the device, but because a higher compliance in the, um, in the um, telemedicine group. And now 10 years later, my friends, uh, uh, my friend Danino Pani, which is now associate professor in uh, bioengineering at the University of Cagliari has upgraded the um, device for rehabilitation, which now consists in a I'm sorry to be so complicated. <laughs> Okay, no problem. We can move forward. I just want to show you the upgraded uh, device.
Okay. Now you, you can see here this is a, the new device with which is um, which includes wearable sensor and uh, uh, which should be connected to a video and to a telemetry console. And the patients have to put the um, wearable sensor over the joint before performing the telerehabilitation. And we have a wearable sensor for the upper arms and also for the lower arms. And is going to perform the telerehabilitation at home or even outside. And this, this web-based platform could be programmed for many type of rehabilitation and is now under experimentation for stroke, but we are planning to perform a randomized control trial for spondylar arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. And the doctor is allowed to check the progress of the patients from remote and to um, share a message with the patient using a delayed messaging program. Okay. I don't want to check your, your emails. Okay, I'm sorry, it, it was more complicated than I imagined. Okay, and the other randomized control trials is about uh, telemonitoring of disease activity, is a small pilot randomized control trial in a patient with early rheumatoid arthritis. We have two arms, one arms, which is the experimental one, in, including 21 patients who performed a monthly telemonitoring of disease activity using a questionnaire at patient reported outcomes, which is the rheumatoid arthritis impact of disease that should be filled by, by every patient using this web-based platform. And all other arms is use a conventional strategies for uh, trip to target uh, uh, treatment. So patients were allowed to change therapy every month in, in the group with the intensive strategy based on the um, results of the ride. Whilst in the conventional strategy, the trip to target approach was uh, performed quarterly. And the results of this randomized control trial is that Patients in the mm, treatment intensive strategies have better disease activity control after 12 months. This is because the physician was able to change the treatment every, every month using a, mm, uh, an objective measure of this activity, which is right. And also they um, demonstrated that for the first time that ride having a very good correlation with the die could be used in uh, um, remote consultation and other telemedicine approach. Now, the second group of uh, telemedicine intervention is the synchronous one and it encompass the phone consultation, which uh, we know that uh, a very low cost and high feasibility, but very low accuracy. We have the video consultation, which have moderate to high uh, accuracy, still low cost, but low protocol standardization. And then we have the presenter assisted consultation, which um, need a presenter, which is a health professional um, skilled for uh, performing the physical examination, who perform the physical examination and uh, message with a specialist uh, from remote. Uh, ob obviously, this, this is not uh, what we call telemedicine because it's uh, really dependent on the, the, on the presenter skill and has high, um, has high cost and very low feasibility. 
Now, the second question is, does any one of you have experience with any of this synchronous telemedicine? Please show your hands. Okay, I, I imagine a lot, of, a lot of you. And who does telemedicine or teleconsultation before COVID? Nobody's. Oh, just Antonio. Okay, one, two. Okay. Phone consultation or video consultation? Phone consultation, that's obvious. But we know that phone consultation is not a, a really <laughs> a visit. Okay, so that was quite um, obviously because telemedicine was an emerging field even before pandemic, but COVID-19 has accelerated the process by increasing the use of telemedicine and also the number of, of study published on this topic. As you can see here, the number had a very uh, low increase every year and then doubled between 2019 and 2020. And that's, this was also because uh, the lockdown imposed trying to halt the viral spreading uh, as um, uh, because of the lockdown, we have to switch many in-person visits in uh, remote consultation and also a lot of uh, in-person visits were cancelled because of the um, pandemics and that's it's true especially for patient established patient in follow-up visits we received a very high amount of uh, remote consultation while, while new patients uh, still have in-person visits uh, despite the pandemic Generally speaking, uh, physicians prefer to perform um, the um, video consultation, vir virtual visits in patients uh, with established diagnosis because they have a well-known history and a high percentage of them are in low disease activity or remission. And no ma nobody wants to have a first encounter with a patient in um, so the first visit uh, uh, from remote because we strongly rely on physical examination to do the diagnosis. Moreover, the only study who performed um, check, which is the rate of correct diagnosis during the first visit using televisit had very bad outcome. I have to acknowledge that this is a low quality study, but uh, only 40% of correct diagnoses were made by video consultation and only 35% by phone consultation. So new patient is not the best for uh, virtual consultation. And uh, mm, between video consultation and phone consultation, video consultation is considered much better. Patient, uh, the physician have... Mm, are much more comfortable using video consultation because we, we can perform a sort of um, physical examination and it's preserved the patient doctor relations, relationship, at least in part, and it's highly accepted by physician and also by, by patients. How, uh, however, it, it lacks specific outcomes. This is a major problem. And because of this major problem, um, the American College of Rheumatology and other scientific societies, including the Italian Society for Rheumatologists, have uh, mm, adopted patient reported outcomes and self assessed joint count, swollen and joint count, as the uh, outcome measure to be used in uh, virtual visits. And if you check, Internet is full of tutorial for self-assessment of joint uh, count, so in swollen joint count and tender joint count, but the uh, validity of this modification is still very, very limited. In fact, in 2020, Solomon and Rudin, in their review, which is a very good review, I suggest uh, those who are interested in this topic to, to, to read it. Then, they state that the research, research into the effectiveness of virtual visits compared with in-person visits is lacking, and there are no data to draw a conclusion about the effectiveness of virtual visits. 
In this uh, scenario, we, uh, during the first lockdown, the first Italian lockdown, we uh, designed an, an observational study aimed to evaluate the reliability of virtual video assisted follow-up visits. So patients with a, an, an established diagnosis who, was, who were followed um, in, uh, in our clinic in order to identify the need for adjusting treatment because inadequate disease control. And we use the face-to-face -face consultation as the gold standard and compare the two, the two different methods. How? That those patients who attended a virtual video assisted consultation in the last two weeks of the lockdown were called to complete the rheumatology evaluation in the next two weeks. And so we were able to compare the results. Then 100, 106 patients uh, participated, 25 rheumatoid arthritis, 30 psoriatic arthritis, 22 ankylosing spondylitis, and 29 patients with uh, SLE. And we use as a primary endpoint the accuracy of video consultation in identifying the need for adjusting treatment for inadequate disease control. So increasing corticosteroids, increasing uh, immunosuppressant, prescribing new um, corticosteroid or new immunosuppressant, both conventional or biologics. And the other treatment de decision was considered secondary outcome. In order to standardize the treatment decision, we use both measure of patient reported outcomes and physician outcome of disease activity. So we use one patient reported outcome and one outcome of disease activity for every disease. And as showed by the traffic light, good disease activity control was set as having a, a threshold of the patient reported outcome or outcome of disease activity which um, equal to the remission or the low disease activity. If a patient have, doesn't reach this threshold, was considered as uh, suffering with inadequate disease activity control and the physician was allowed to change the therapy. And uh, okay. This is a short video showing uh, how the patient performed the patient reported outcomes. All of them received an email before consultation and they were able to fill in the um, patient reported outcomes that was for rheumatoid arthritis, the uh, ride, then the patient, uh, patient global assessment and the global health status. And that was performed electronic, electronically in telemedicine and then routinely in face-to-face -face, uh, visits. And the results were then compared up to the study and I showed you in a minute. And then every patient performed a, a video consultation with a joint self-assessment Patients were instructed on how to recognize inflamed, swollen, and tender joints, and how to assess them for softness, pain. And you can see here, maybe I stopped too later. We know that this is a patient with psoriatic arthritis. And if you looked at the third fingers bilaterally, he has ductilite, bilateral ductilitis. And also, if you look at the, at the wrist, he has. He has a, a swollen wrist here. And continuing with the um, self-assessment validation, I asked him to perform a physician-driven examination of the joints, showing them on video and reporting whether they were painful, swollen, or tender. If you look at his face, when he check the third finger is not happy at all because it, the hearts, we can move forward, maybe, maybe not. I don't want to bore you with all the video, but just showing. The last part. No, we can show you, but the, the, the content is that when he showed the wrist, he wasn't able to um, have 
pain while squeezing by the, by side, but when it's squeezed by uh, over the tendon, the extensor tendon, it was uh, he has pain because this was, you know, of course, uh, tenosynovitis of the extender tendons that is quite uh, common in, in psoriatic arthritis. And also using this kind of uh, technology, you can perform further examination on cutaneous lesion on, or other inspectable signs. And this is a lady with lupus, and this is clearly uh, vasculitis, That's, uh, that lesion uh, uh, typical of vasculitis in lupus, and she also had a very bad, the picture is not so good, but uh, she had a very bad discoid lesion with the uh, uh, scarring uh, alopecia. So moving to uh, the results, uh, the face-to-face -face visit confirmed the remotely delivered treatment decision in, 18, in 84% of visit. And if we look at uh, the sensitivity and specificity for the primary endpoints, so the need for adjusting treatment, we have a very high sensitivity, very high specificity. During face-to-face -face visit, 17 patients were confirmed as need to uh, change treatment, and uh, um, 16 of them were catched by virtual visits. So very high specificity, which is uh, what we need to use virtual consultation as a surrogate of uh, in-person visit. While the other endpoints were was not uh, equally good, especially tapering cessation, stopping uh, treatment for good disease activity. And uh, unfortunately, th this was uh, mainly for elderly patients. Uh, in fact, the 17 discordant visits, uh, 12 out of 17 discordant visits were in patients with lupus. And if you have a look at the patient reported outcomes, they have high reliability when performed remotely, whether the tender joint count, swollen joint count, DAPSA, SLIDI, and also physician global assessment in lupus when used remotely, uh, not so good uh, reliability. We identified so the so-called bad guys, so the barriers for virtual consultation that are systemic diseases that need an extensive physical examination and also concomitant fibromyalgia because of course the patient reported outcomes doesn't work very well in this patient and also older age of and lack of digital skills, both for patients and for doctors. In fact, the younger and more resilient uh, physician are those that uh, are able to obtain the better from virtual consultation. Patient, patient with, were also highly satisfied with the quality of telemedicine service and uh, all their needs were satisfied, but this is consistent in all studies on telemedicine. Patients really agree to uh, have um, telemedicine intervention not only be treated by telemedicine, but have some kind of telemedicine intervention. We have some advantages and some disadvantages, of course, in telemedicine. And in conclusion, we could say that video visiting should not replace the standard approach, but might be effectively used in support of type control, or even in case where a patient cannot attend the clinic. And that's the way we are still using uh, telemedicine, if a patient have uh, to um, come to the clinic and uh, have 200 kilometers traf uh, trip, I prefer to have a pre-visit in uh, telemedicine. And then if we really need an uh, in-person visit, I schedule in the clinic in one week or, or, or that. So my take home messages are uh, telemedicine application have gained a growing role in recent years and boomed during the COVID-19 pandemics. Patient reported outcomes have been suggested for, for use as outcome measure in virtual visit, but they have not been extensively validated. Virtual video consultation for systemic autoimmune disease showed high sensitivity and specificity when compare, compared with the face-to-face -face visits, so are good surrogate, but cannot replace the in-person visit. And further strategies, strategies are needed to improve the accuracy of video visiting in elderly patients. Probably, I think that probably 
the approach that we choose in for SLE was not good, but not that televisiting is not good for SLE patients. And that's it. Follow me on Twitter or just send me an email to say hello or whatever. Thank you very much. Um, before giving the, the word to the audience, I have two questions to you about your program uh, and your study. How you selected the patients to include in your study? Um, all of them uh, you excluded with digital illiteracy, how, how you choose them? Yeah. And uh, uh, the second question, uh, how you will use in your clinical practice in the future when we don't have uh, COVID-19, okay. this app and this technology? Okay, first question, patients were selected from the um, tight control clinics for the respective diseases. So we have two kinds of uh, clinic. We have the patients that are under control for many years that attend one clinic and patients that are considered not well stabilized because they change, um, they have a recent diagnosis or change uh, immunosuppressive uh, in recently. So we ask uh, those patients who attended in the last two weeks of the lockdown if they want to perform the video consultation. So it was not a standard strategy that was all only for uh, the study, but we, uh, we want to um, perform this visit in patients that are not completely under control. The disease was not completely stable, just because if you have um, stable patient, probably we, uh, we don't have uh, enough patient that need adjustment to reach the, uh, the outcome. So if I take 100 patients st with stabilized disease, only one need to change treatment, I, 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 can't, I can't make statistics. So <laughs> this is why we choose just this patient. And in the future, you will second, use... Se yeah. Okay, second <laughs> question. In the future, um, what I would like to do is to um, perform the um, telemonitoring of disease activity by remote, but it requires strength in terms of person that work on telemedicine and so we can do it. I will continue to use televisiting as I told before for those patients that are far away from the clinic and uh, ask for an urgent, urgent visit or something like that. So maybe just to check if they are really urgent, if I need to see them tomorrow or in one month. I can still use the video consultation. Matteo, uh, thank you for your uh, nice talk. Uh, I have two, also two questions. But one of the things that, that are uh, in many articles that uh, I've read about telemedicine is the, the loss of empathy between uh, the, the, the medical and, uh, and the patient. And uh, some, some talk about the, the poor mental health because of that and also more pain. Uh, did you saw that? And uh, did you think, uh, did you uh, also check if uh, the patients have more dropout of the consultation or therapeutic adherence? Okay. Uh, so the loss of the patient doctor relationship is common when you use telemedicine, in those programs that use telemedicine for every visit. This study was one single teleconsultation in patients that were uh, well known in our clinic. So we didn't have experience of uh, much pain. Uh, it was the opposite. The patients were very happy to see, uh, to see the doctor through the Zoom, uh, having a Zoom consultation. But I think that uh, as we told before, using all, only telemedicine could be a bad idea, especially for patients with chronic disease, such as the systemic autoimmune diseases. More questions from the audience? Thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. Uh, I'm very surprised by the very high level of satisfaction for teleconsultation, uh, because this is what you said. I think the patients like to see their doctors. 
Do you think that the biggest reason for that is the fact not to go to the hospital to stay at home? Is this what is the highest weight in this satisfaction? Uh, probably that could be uh, an answer, but maybe we have also a bias on that because that was a time where the, it was supposed that patients can't see the doctor. So they, they were very happy, very grateful for this opportunity to have their visit, uh, even in the pan during the pandemic. But if you look uh, to other um, other series, different from the uh, that one from Cagliari, this is a, a series from Australia when they should cover hundred and hundred kilometers to uh, reach the clinic. And the level of satisfaction is quite the same. 70% more or less agree uh, or strongly agree with any of this, uh, this statement that is uh, about all, uh, all of them are about satisfaction. So uh, probably we have to identify those patients that are more, um, I can see, are the best patient for virtual visits. And, uh, uh, for sure, uh, 20 to 30 percent of patients are not uh, good for the virtual visit. Any more questions, Professor? Thank you, Matteo. Very nice talk. Uh, so, uh, you said that that is time consuming. Yeah. Is it is it more than the presential patient? Yeah. yeah. We, um, we uh, perform a visit in clinic in uh, 20 minutes, average time, and the video consultation took 30 to 40 minutes because it's much more difficult the physical examination. You have to ask the patient to take off the dress. The, when you do it in the clinic, uh, you are... Um, Writing, yeah. you are <laughs> in video consultation. That's not possible. So that time consuming. Well, that is a big problem, I see. Yeah, video consultation. Yeah. Mm. You... Okay, and and the other thing is, so why there was sixteen percent of of discordance uh, between face to face and virtual? Uh, are there reasons, specific reason for that? Yeah, the, the main reason were uh, in patient with lupus, uh, difficult to mm, distinguish between fibromyalgia, exactly, and, uh, and symptom. Uh, uh, and also in lupus, uh, you need uh, um, uh, much more extensive physical examination. You have to listen from the lungs, you have to um, perform a, a, a visit. And uh, that was not possible. So in a patient with pleuritic pain, you have to um, manage uh, her with a, uh, at least physical examination and at least a uh, chest X-ray, and that was not possible. That was the two main reason for this cardinals. Thank you. And that is, is a point, uh, Laura, you didn't talk about there is no, in 2028, uh, a device that near the lung and do hear the, the sounds. <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> My personal opinion is uh, that we are going too fast in the direction of this digital medicine. We have not enough data. We are not prepared. We um, probably, as Laurent told us, in, in the United States, which is completely different from Europe, they could do digital medicine. Medicine. Um, before, so, so in, in, the, in the next years, but uh, I don't think that we are ready for that. But as we are talking about Portugal, I think in Italy is similar to us. You don't, uh, you don't uh, see that patients want to see uh, uh, their doctor uh, face to face now after COVID in Italy? Mm, not really, not no. <laughs> no. <laughs> because not in Portugal, really. many of my patients want to see the doctor. Yeah, probably a, a, a rate of patients, but um, younger patients, which is, uh, are good uh, on therapy, 
they don't want to to see me <laughs> they just want the the prescription for the biologics or whatever yeah. okay so now we 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 close this session thank you professor Laurent and professor Matteo for this talk so we now go to the coffee break
So, good afternoon. We start again the last session. So, Luis, is it Luis? Isn't it? Hello. Uh, we are moving in systemic loops erythematose in two different fields the refractory disease on one and tailor therapy. So, it's a uh, important uh, target, uh, I think. So, Luis, would you mind, uh, first of all, good afternoon, too. <laughs> uh, uh, so, it's my pleasure to have you co-chair, uh, all in virtual way, but this is the new world, the future of, of the, world, the world. So, would you mind to introduce uh, our speakers, um, the um, the Marielle got to the Padova, if you don't mind, because I, I will do the same with the George Bertzias from, uh, from Crete. Would you mind start, please? Yes. Uh, hello to, to everyone. Uh, it is a, a great privilege to be here and uh, comrade, moderate this session with Dr. Carlos Ferreira. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria Gato from the uh, University of uh, Padova, uh, was work in the SLE and, uh, and lupus in the uh, animal models of lupus nephritis. I have been, been following and uh, much uh, admire. Uh, Dr. Gato will speak about uh, tailored root therapy in SLE. Uh, after the, the two sessions, we'll have a discussion about this, uh, this uh, round table. So please, Dr. Gato. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor, for the introduction. Thanks, Professor Vasconcelos, for the invitation. And sorry not to have been able to join in person. So I will give my best in the lecturing distance. Let me share my slides. So. You should see them now. Um, put the presentation mode. Yeah. So uh, today I'm going to uh, to give an overview on on a new approach, which should be like uh, something that we start doing right now in the last few years. So how we manage a tailored treatment for SLE. And uh, I would like to go through this agenda. So just to recall uh, that we are changing indeed our uh, approach, our paradigm to treating SLD patients and to go in depth uh, in drugs that we are now using uh, um, more and more uh, often with, with a more and more confidence and, uh, and, uh, and also giving an overview on the new upcoming. Okay. Uh, so I think I muted, sorry. Okay, no, you can hear me. So the rationale uh, for treating to target uh, in SLE comes indeed from the evidence that we still have uh, a great unmet needs in, in, uh, in the lupus population, which um, still is, is burdened by a greater mortality, a significantly greater mortality than the general population. We know this, we know that despite the prognosis of SLE patients has improved in the last decades, it's still is not comparable to the prognosis of the general population. To make the long story short, we know that damage is indeed one of the main determinants of this poor prognosis. And we know that damage, it, was, it is now widely demonstrated, is, is greatly depending on uh, scarce control of disease activity. Yes, so either the, the persistence of disease activity or uh, the uh, occurrence of disease flares and uh, especially in the later stages of disease, uh, lupus patients tend to accrue damage uh, due to uh, drug-related side effects, especially owing to uh, steroid use. So, of course, the uh, International Task Force has um, conceived some uh, short and long-term uh, uh, goals in the treatment of SLE, which basically aim at uh, controlling this activity in the short term and to remove Mm, uh, the, the triggers of organ damage in the long term. And as you can see, uh, the aim uh, for the lowest effective dose of glucocorticoids still remains among the major uh, long-term outcomes in, in lupus treatment. So uh, we can say that we are adopting a step, a step down, um, let's say, 
free to target approach, which aims at controlling this activity in the first place and to minimize treatment uh, uh, thereafter. Why that? Uh, well, because we know that disease control of disease activity now, regardless of the definition used, we know there are many, uh, is associated with indeed a reduce, a significantly reduce uh, organ damage. And we know that uh, high dose steroids are indeed uh, uh, accompanying the uh, accumulation of damage, especially when we talk about uh, cumulative prednisone dose. Uh, we see that over time, lupus patients tend to accrue damage very early during their disease course, and the, the disease, uh, the disease, this is going in parallel with the with the cumulative burden of those that they uh, they uh, receive. So, are the new drugs uh, able to to uh, help in in achieving uh, actually the uh, the goals of the treatment target? Well. Mm, uh, first of all, it's, it's important to underline that we talk about new drugs, but we are lucky to do that because um, we can just do this for the last 10 years. Before, we didn't have that much to uh, use in order to uh, achieve uh, our goals. Now, and this will be also the object of the presentation, in the last decade especially, we are having some promising new uh, drugs in the armamentarium of lupus. And the first one that I would like to spend a couple of words about is belimumab, which we still somehow refer to as a new drug, but has a 10-year history now, at least in the treatment of lupus in Europe and all over the world, and uh, uh, is indeed included uh, among the uh, most recent recommendations uh, of, the, uh, of the Euler Task Force. Uh, just, this is just to underline that these recommendations have put belimumab in the center, of course, so lupus treatment for refractory or uh, manifestations. But what is indeed uh, uh, probably important for our clinical practice is that the uh, new recommendations uh, aim at defining also the standard of care in lupus and uh, state that belimumab is uh, usable when a disease refractory to standard of care is, uh, is occurring. And standard of care does not necessarily mean uh, presence of immunosuppressive agents, suggesting that a patient can receive belimumab uh, even if the response was just inadequate to antimalarials and corticosteroids. This is a pretty new approach if we consider that in across several countries and in several cohorts in real life, belimumab is still seen as a second or third light treatment, so for refractory SLE, which has failed at least one or two uh, standard uh, traditional immunosuppressant. This is important uh, in trials, but also in real life. And uh, I would like indeed to share with you a real life experience that we have, um, that we have collected uh, all over the last, uh, I would say six years because the, uh, the data recording was started from the very beginning of, of Belimum abuse in Italy. And we uh, managed to indeed include more than 460 lupus patients in this cohort. And as you can see, even before the uh, actual statement from Euler, uh, sort of 40% of the patients in this cohort in real life had indeed received belimumab before uh, having failed the traditional immunosuppressant. This is important because they indeed received belimumab pretty early in their disease course. And if we uh, take a look to the rate of response that was uh, analyzing this cohort, as you can see here, we tested or sort of analyzed the response rate of our patients and the rate of patients who would achieve remission low disease activity in this uh, wide multicentric cohort. Well, we evaluated the predictors uh, of response at baseline. And we could see, we could show that uh, uh, an early, so a short disease duration before belimumab administration, which means an early uh, provision of the drug, in, especially in patients uh, who uh, exhibited a higher disease activity, would, uh, be, uh, would herald, would herald uh, a, better, a better response. And also, I think it's interesting to underline that patients uh, who had uh, uh, no damage at the baseline were the ones uh, who responded better. Um, the analysis was significant in 12 months. The rate of response was always higher in these patients, but 12 months is indeed also a, a critical point uh, uh, of evaluation because it's uh, often the time in which uh, we decide uh, or 
assess whether the drug is working or not. So it's important to know uh, that if we use the drug early enough in, patient, in active patients, we can gain a better response. And we also evaluated the percentage of time, this is like a fashionable concept, uh, spent in low disease activity or remission in our cohort. And we could see that uh, more than 60% of patients spent uh, uh, a consistent period of time in low disease activity. And more than 40% of, of patients spent uh, um, a relevant period of time into remission. And this was associated with a lower rate of damage accrual, which is the ultimate goals of all our struggle to locate a drug in the patient path. Again, the predictors of achievement of uh, remission and low disease activity included uh, uh, a baseline damage, which, uh, which was zero as an independent predictor. But it's important to note that the lower the damage, the greater the chance to achieve a complete uh, remission, uh, but it should be also underlined that patient with a with a, with a, a damage which was still present were included in the cohort and they could still uh, reach low disease activity and remission. So the fact that they had an SDI higher than zero did not uh, jeopardize the uh, long term efficacy of the drugs most of the time. And importantly, also. Um, what we have noticed by comparing before and after belimumab use, uh, we could see that uh, patients receiving belimumab compared to themselves in the period in the same exact period before would uh, develop uh, less flares or would have a, uh, a more controlled disease over time. And as we know, this is important as we have mentioned that uh, a higher disease activity and the presence of flares are among the major determinants of damage. Consistently, this is a table which I don't like, but just to underline that the prediction on those among other variables that we have analyzed was also decreasing over time. And according to what we said in the very beginning, uh, this cohort uh, of patients receiving the drug properly would be able to control their disease activity together with reducing the prednisone the on those safely. And this is very important in terms of progression of them. So in our, um, in our experience and in experience of real-life cohorts, it seems that the best candidates to belimumab, um, and we now talk about the SLE patients okay, without major organ involvement, are patients with higher disease activity, especially having acute manifestations uh, who have possibly no damage or a low damage accrual in the beginning and who receive uh, uh, bilimumab early during this course. And um, so concerning bilimumab, this is what we could depict uh, according to uh, real life experience. Coming to the new drugs, uh, which are important uh, to be inserted now in the new frame of uh, uh, SLE treatment, we know that the FDA has recently approved all the drugs that you see here, and is about to approve um, uh, ma uh, many more, which we don't have time to, um, to, to, to talk about. But I thought it would be interesting to, uh, as we want to uh, go uh, deeper into the topic of tailored treatment in SED, to also uh, go over the features that were characterized um, by the same, the trial themselves to identify the patients who could gain the best benefit from uh, the use of these new drugs. Especially on Ifronoma, we know that this is a drug targeting the type one uh, interferon receptor, and it induces then a sort of switch off of the production of inflammatory cytokines. We know that it was successful in TULIP2 trial phase three, and this led to uh, then the approval of the drug. It is important to note that in this study, the patients were stratified not only according to their clinical features, but for the first time, according to their endotypes. So it means the interferon signature, the expression of genes under the control of interferon type one. And uh, indeed, this uh, uh, resulted, uh, was one of the components that were then highlighted as uh, uh, impacting on the response of the drugs. 
um, as we can see here, indeed, this is a result that we are all know. It uh, the, the study reached the primary endpoint, which was uh, uh, the vehicular response uh, over time. And uh, bearing in mind uh, what we mentioned in the beginning, so that drug should be successful even in reducing the, the burden of, of steroid, uh, steroid uh, administration. Uh, Anifronima was indeed capable of reducing the glucocorticoid exposure of the patients significantly at a, at a significantly higher rate than placebo did. And at the same time, it, patients receiving anifrolumab were able to have their annual flare rate significantly reduced, which, uh, as we mentioned many times during the presentation, would impact uh, in the long-term damage. And as suggested in the beginning, the type 1 interferon gene signature test uh, suggested that a patient with a high signature here would benefit, uh, um, would, would more convincingly benefit from the administration of the drug. And this is an example of uh, a tailored or a dedicated uh, administration to patients who, who could preferentially benefit from the drug itself. Of course, doesn't mean that it doesn't work in the other patients, but it's important to stratify patients according to uh, their uh, likelihood to uh, gain benefit from a given treatment. And just a couple of words on lupus nephritis because it was uh, one of the, major, uh, of, the, of the major organ involvement in lupus, which still were burdened by a great uh, unmet need in their, in their management. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's a good news that we have now at least three uh, new drugs that are coming or are already licensed for lupus nephritis. And this is uh, like uh, the, the, the updated uh, recommendations for management of lupus nephritis released last year. And I would say that the greater news uh, concerned the management of uh, uh, class five and probably uh, the, the administration of, uh, of uh, calcineurin inhibitors. So just to recall, um, uh, the calcineurin inhibitors uh, have a double-phased uh, effect in lupus nephritis because uh, they uh, act directly on T cells by uh, reducing the, the production of IL-2. Uh, and they can, on the other hand, also stabilize the actin cytoskeleton of photocytes, thereby resulting in a better, um, in a, in a, in a better stabilization of the photocyte barrier. This is important to uh, face the increased burden of proteinuria, which is then reduced uh, by the use of uh, uh, calcium urine inhibitors by at least two concomitant mechanisms. Voclosporin, in respect to other uh, calcium urine inhibitors, which we know, so tacronimus and cyclosporin, is a little bit more stable and therefore uh, shows a greater potency in respect to the other drugs. And it seems to be better tolerated in terms of metabolic uh, uh, side effects. So meaning glucose profile, lipid profile, and seems to interact uh, at a lower rate with mycophenol is mofetil. This means that the drugs can be used in combination uh, with, uh, with a greater safety. And these are the trials that led to the approval of the drug for lupus nephritis. And in, both in the proof of concept in the phase two and in phase three trial, uh, the endpoint was reached of improved, uh, uh, complete, uh, and partial renal response. What is important in this trial is, of course, the drug itself, but also uh, the uh, rapid, as you can see here, steroid tapering that was provided to the patient, which was much faster than what we uh, were used to see, it, uh, for example, in the rituximab trials. And this uh, probably was able to uh, highlight the additional benefit of, the, of, of this drug on, on lupus nephritis patients. As we mentioned, the, uh, the voclosporin uh, achieved uh, uh, its primary endpoints, both uh, uh, referring to complete and partial renal response with a good uh, safety profile. Um, just quickly on belimumab and lupus nephritis, I have voluntarily separated this part from the first part on belimuma because this is a newer achievement. We know that uh, the trial that led to belimuma approval for lupus nephritis was started uh, um, uh, on the 
former indication of the Lumumba for general SLE, so non-renal SLE, and the drug was given on top, of course, of what we classically call initial treatment for lupus nephritis, and the patients were, were, uh, separate, were uh, randomized, uh, and, and the primary endpoint was indeed the achievement of the, uh, of the primary efficacy renal response. Um, I would like to, uh, to share with you the, uh, the, the, the rate of response that was significantly higher in the whole cohort, but especially in patients who showed features of, of proliferative lupus nephritis in patients who had received uh, mycophenol hemophetyl as a uh, standard of care in, in, uh, in combination with belivomab, which is a pretty common situation, at least in my center, we uh, very often use mycophenol hemophetyl. And the fact that belivomab can be successfully added on top, fruitfully added on top, is uh, actually good news. Um, again, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, also an observation on the time, not only to response, but also to first flare, which was, uh, which was decreased in patients, uh, significantly decreased in patients receiving uh, belimumab for nearly uh, every situation. We also, as a, a national uh, group, uh, wanted to explore this, uh, not uh, in a patient with a very active nephritis, but in a, in a subgroup of patients uh, who had uh, who, who presented with renal involvement uh, at the time of the limumab initiation, meaning a proteinuria that was not very well controlled and or signs of uh, of uh, uh, inflammation in the urine. So. Uh, active urinary sediment. And uh, this is the rate of response that was uh, uh, evaluated. So we uh, chose the same endpoint uh, of, uh, of the uh, bliss lupus nephritis trial. And uh, as predictors of response at baseline, we uh, again could show that patients who have indeed a more advanced disease, so who have a long standing hypertension, a higher proteinuria, and a higher serum creatinine tend to respond less, uh, less than pa patients who have, who have probably uh, a, an earlier introduction of the drug again. So who do not have a longstanding hypertension and who uh, have a slightly uh, elevated proteinuria. Um, okay. Just to conclude uh, the overview of new drugs, uh, I thought this was worth mentioning because uh, I'm not sure about the reality in your center, but in my center, we really have to struggle to, to get rituximab when the, the disease is refractory, while uh, the uh, next approval of obinutuzumab will probably pave the way to uh, the introduction of a new anti-CD20 drug in the treatment of lupus nephritis. As we know, because of a difference in the hinge region, uh, the obinutuzumab is a little bit more stable than rituximab, and it seems that it may trigger a higher rate of CD20 cell death. And it resulted in, the, in any case, in higher rate of response, both complete and partial renal response in the recent trial that led again to its uh, success. As final remarks, after we have seen all these, um, I would say, new points upcoming in lupus, uh, the first the thing I would like to mention is the change in paradigm that we have both in the general disease with grid to target and in lupus nephritis, which is something that is, um, has been always very um, uh, touching for myself and for the patients in our cohort. It's important probably to bear in mind that nowadays we are transitioning probably from the more static approach with an induction phase followed by a maintenance phase to, a pro to protocols which envision the concomitants of uh, different treatments, different drugs targeting different targets at doses that can be modulated and tuned accordingly to the patient response and tolerability, probably in a more efficient way. So the message is that we need to, to probably relearn how to use drugs that we thought we knew how to use and to insert them in a new frame. And the second point that is involving other colleagues from other centers and myself is, is the addressing of questions like, how can we really monitor if a patient is responding well to a drug? Because we 
have a lot of discussion on what is important to consider as baseline, but we actually have just a few and very well-known biomarkers for the monitoring, the follow-up of patients receiving any treatment for active SLD. So uh, beside anti-DSDNA and complement, we thought it would be interesting to monitor also the variations. So not only the baseline values, but the whole changes in respect to baseline uh, in patients receiving standard of care plus belimumab uh, or placebo. And so by the post-hoc analysis of the of the belimumab cohorts of the of the uh, phase three trials, it seems that indeed the variation in B cells and especially in memory B cells and in SLE related plasma cells can uh, portend uh, uh, the occurrence of disease flares when they increase in patients who receive uh, belimumab uh, and uh, treatment for active SLE suggesting that beside baseline predictors, we should seek for predictors of response early during treatment. So uh, monitor changes that occur between uh, within eight weeks, uh, 16 and 24 weeks from baseline. This could help, at least in our experience, to um, um, have an idea on how the patient is doing before the clinical symptom appear. So in conclusion, uh, the prognosis of SLE has improved, but there's still a number of amenities remain that can be addressed by the improved use of older drugs and especially new drugs uh, with the aim of achieving our step-down uh, goals in the treat-to-target strategies. We have data available on the Limumab in real life also, which seems to be able to, uh, uh, to, to facilitate the attainment of treat-to-target goals. Of course, this is expected also for the new drugs, and probably we also need tools for personalized patient monitoring. With this, I thank you very much, and I was given the task also to remind you the Lupus Academy in April. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Marielle. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ferreira. I don't know, but uh, maybe it's better to put the discussion uh, right now, or what do you think, Carlos? Carlos Vasconcelos, Carlos Dias. I would suggest to put the discussion in, at the end of the talks. Do you, do you think it's better put right now, because it's fresh? What do you think, uh, Professor Luiz Inés? What do you want? I think it would be a good idea to discuss at the end because uh, both so. these presentations are intermingled. So there are aspects that are uh, uh, treated by both uh, uh, both speakers, and uh, it would be. I think so. I agree with you. I agree with you. So let's go to move in the next speaker, and. Uh, George, Professor George Britius is a lupologist, uh, belongs to uh, systemic lupus, erythematosus, uh, EULAR. This is, this is enough to, to introduce him. So, good afternoon. You can start if you don't mind. Are you here? No? Can you hear me now? Yes, now. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I would also like to thank uh, Professor Carlos Vasconcelos and Carlos Diaz for the uh, invitation to present um, uh, at this meeting. And uh, my talk uh, is indeed uh, uh, complementary to the previous uh, um, uh, presentation by Marielle uh, Gatto on uh, the treatment of SLE, but I will focus on uh, refractory uh, disease. Um, so we already saw this uh, slide in the previous uh, presentation that uh, uh, we now have a variety of uh, therapeutic uh, agents and options in, in the management of, of lupus. And the latest update of the EULA recommendations uh, have attempted to classify disease 
according to the severity and the type of manifestations and provide uh, somehow, let's say, uh, tailored treatment options. And uh, there is uh, also um, a separate, uh, let's say, uh, discussion about the options uh, for um, refractory disease. And I will try to allude a bit more on this uh, aspect uh, during uh, my presentation. Now, the important, however, and very um, uh, in, uh, unmet need in, uh, in lupus is that there is no uh, uniform definition for uh, refractory disease. So uh, we have a variety of agents as already discussed, but we uh, still don't know exactly uh, what it means to have refractory disease. And uh, here are some uh, thoughts. So should we try to define uh, a refractory lupus based on uh, the lack of treatment response? Uh, should we define it according to the lack of um, a, a remission, which is now considered to be uh, the treatment uh, target in the disease? Uh, should we define it based on histological findings? For example, in the case of nephritis, uh, should we define refractory disease if there are um, histological signs of activity, uh, despite the fact that the patient has uh, uh, reduced the, um, the proteinuria? Should we define it based on some, let's say, standard of care treatments for severe disease like cyclophosphamide? I guess the majority of us uh, will consider a lupus to be refractory if it does not respond to uh, such a cytotoxic treatment like cyclophosphamide. Should we define uh, refractory disease as uh, cases that we cannot taper and uh, completely withdraw glucocorticoids? Or is relapsing disease the same as a refractory disease? So th these are some uh, actually open questions and although the recent update of the Euler recommendations uh, started the discussion on, on these uh, topics, these uh, uh, still remain uh, unresolved. Now, the reality is that um, um, the, irrespective of the definition that one can use to define uh, refractory disease, uh, you can uh, find a substantial proportion of uh, patients across various settings in various cohorts, which um, display persistent disease activity or refractory disease, um, therefore highlighting the importance of, uh, of uh, treatment, treatment uh, strategies for this particular sub subset of patients. So these are data coming also from Italy. Uh, you can see here the average follow-up uh, in these patients and, um, uh, and the proportion of patients with uh, persistent activity goes up even to 40% in some cases, or the lesser registry uh, used the definition for refractory disease as failure to at least two immunosuppressive treatments or cyclophosphamide and found that about a quarter of the patients met that definition. So, um, it's not an uncommon thing to find patients who have, uh, let's say, uh, resistant or uh, uh, refractory disease. Now, um, uh, Marielle Gatto mentioned the fact that indeed there is a change in the mindscape or in treating lupus uh, that says that uh, e even after failure to cyclophosphate, to uh, hydroxychloroquine and uh, glucocorticoids, um, this is uh, an indication to, to initiate uh, uh, potent treatments such as biologics. However, for the context of this presentation, um, I, I would like to introduce two different scenarios. So the first scenario is that we have a non-organ, non-life-threatening disease. And the second, that we have a severe life-threatening uh, disease. So in the first case, I believe that uh, the majority would consider refractory lupus as a patient who has inadequate clinical response or cannot taper glucocorticoids to acceptable levels in spite of treatment with hydroxychloroquine, but also at least another 
uh, DMARD or immunosuppressive agent, and particularly methotrexate or azathioprine. I believe that still the majority of patients, unless there are specific uh, contraindications or uh, specific settings, will receive this type of treatment. And of course, I totally agree, and we do this all that uh, we are increasingly using belimumab right after hydroxychloroquine. But for, for the purpose of this presentation, I, I think that refractory lupus is probably a patient who does not uh, respond to hydroxychloroquine, glucocorticoids, and or and uh, uh, either methotrexate or azathioprine. Now, in the case of organ or life-threatening disease, uh, it's failure to the first line recommended treatment, depending on uh, on the type of the of the disease, whether this is lupus nephritis, neuropsychiatric lupus, etc. Now, uh, Carlos uh, Vasconcelos asked me not to discuss about uh, lupus nephritis because Ricard Cervera has a round table and uh, I'm sure you'll be hearing very interesting uh, things there. So I will not focus really on, uh, on the management of refractory nephritis. So um, this is a, a case that we managed in the clinic uh, a few years ago. Uh, it, a woman is 26 years old, newly parous. Uh, she had been diagnosed with lupus uh, in 2018, and she had active disease because of uh, polyarthritis, ulcers, hair loss, fatigue, and elevated at the double stranded DNA. Uh, and uh, she had been uh, uh, treated with hydroxychloroquine, she was on a prednisone. Uh, 12.5 milligram, and uh, she had tried azathioprine, which was discontinued because she developed the flu-like uh, syndrome. So the question uh, in, in this case is, what should be the next step? And um, should we switch azathioprine to, to methotrexate? Should we give uh, pulses of uh, glucocorticoids and uh, reevaluate the disease after, let's say, three to six months? Should we switch to mycophenolate or consider uh, biological agents? And uh, at this time, belimumab is that um, agent, but uh, shortly we will also have anifrolumab um, as the previous speaker um, uh, showed the, the data. So first, when we consider the possibility of a refractory disease, we need to think uh, whether the patient is indeed uh, compliant to treatment. And, and this is another thing that also the, the recent recommendations, especially the nephritis ones, uh, highlight the fact that we should uh, regularly assess, especially in cases of, uh, of non-responding disease, whether there is, um, if the patient adheres to the treatment. And uh, this has been best illustrated in the case of hydroxychloroquine, where um, um, uh, 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 if you measure blood levels of uh, hydroxychloroquine, you can realize that a, a significant proportion of patients are non-compliant or have sub-therapeutic levels uh, below 500 nanogram per uh, milliliter, which could be due to reduced bioviability of the drug. Uh, we, we don't exactly know which factors uh, um, have a negative influence of the bio availability of the drug. However, it is probable that body weight, renal function, smoking, uh, comorbidities and comedications can uh, have an impact. And why is this important? Because patients who have uh, uh, optimal levels of hydroxychloroquine are less uh, prone to flare as compared to those who have intermediate or low levels of the drug. And uh, there are few reports showing that if you could actually monitor blood hydroxychloroquine levels and, uh, and maybe adjusted those to achieve uh, a therapeutic level in the blood, you could even improve uh, efficacy, especially in, in skin disease as illustrated in this, uh, in this work. But uh, here we are to discuss mostly the scenario where the patient uh, uh, you know, is, uh, takes, takes the medications and uh, however, uh, still exhibits uh, active disease. So one of the drugs that is increasingly used in, in lupus, not only in renal lupus, but also extra renal lupus, 
with uh, uh, a good uh, uh, efficacy and safety, also data, is mycophenolate. Uh, and um, although the drug has not uh, really uh, tested extensively in the context of trials, I will show you a, a single control study uh, later on. There is uh, accruing evidence from observational studies showing that uh, the drug is being used in combination with glucocorticoids to treat a variety of lupus manifestations, including vasculitis, musculoskeletal disease, skin disease, um, hematological disease. And, uh, and uh, it is considered most efficacious in the refractory cases of subacute cutaneous lupus, uh, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, uh, with musculoskeletal disease, I would say that uh, probably uh, arthritis uh, responds less uh, well to the treatment, but uh, other, uh, like myositis, other manifestations do respond. And also vasculitis can be reversed by the use of mycophenolate. So uh, if you look the evidence in the literature, you can see that the response appears after three uh, to six months and it uh, can rise up to 50% um, at 12 months. Uh, relapses do occur while the patient is receiving mycophenolate, about 30% um, may relapse. And um, when should you consider mycophenolate? Actually, uh, when uh, you would like to treat your patient with an agent that works a bit better than azathioprine, or when you would like to give your patient a cyclophosphamide, but you want to avoid cyclophosphamide because of the risk for uh, toxicity, especially ovarian toxicity. So mycophenolate is becoming more and more like a standard of care in, uh, in lupus, I would say. And there is a single uh, trial, controlled trial, in relatively new onset lupus, uh, it was published a few years ago. Um, 240 patients were randomized to receive other than the mycophenolic acid form of uh, mycophenolate or azathioprine, uh, both on top of glucocorticoids. And here you can see the type of the disease that these patients have. You see that uh, quite a few of them had uh, serocytes. This is reflected under the uh, category of cardiorespiratory disease. Uh, but also mucocutaneous, musculoskeletal, and a few had also hematological or other manifestations. What this study showed was the superiority of mycophenolate over azathioprine um, in terms of renal remission and times to remission. And another important finding that we also see this in clinical practice is that mycophenolate works better than azathioprine in prevention of flares. Uh, this has been shown also in lupus nephritis, but also it's true for extra renal disease. And here you see the rates of BILAC A of severe flares. It was 22% with azathioprine as compared to 8%, and including cases of uh, new onset nephritis, which were less uh, with, uh, with mycophenolate. And uh, overall, I think that through the years and uh, through the increasing use uh, use of uh, this agent, we have learned uh, to cope with its toxicity, which is actually not very severe one, unless uh, you use it at high doses and uh, with uh, glucocorticoids, but doses that are close to two uh, grams per day uh, are less toxic. We don't see a lot of uh, liver or blood toxicity. Um, uh, so it's an acceptable uh, toxicity profile. Now, the other opportunity to treat a refractory disease, uh, meaning a disease that uh, does not respond to uh, hydroxychloroquine and at least one DMARD is belimumab. And this has already been uh, discussed uh, during the previous uh, speaker. I would like to highlight a couple of things. The fact that um, uh, belimumab showed even a higher effect, uh, treatment effect in, uh, in the subset of patients who had high disease activity. Uh, now, uh, how is this defined? Uh, uh, if you have a SLID eye of 10 at least, or serologically active patients, or patients requiring steroids, this is written in Greek, uh, which, me, which is actually an indicator of, uh, of a severe active disease, let's say. 
And this is the uh, well-known uh, postdoc analysis by Ronald Van Wallenhoven showing exactly that in this subgroup of high disease activity, uh, the limumab led to a 52% almost SRI response as compared to 31.7, so a difference by 20%. And also there was almost a 40% reduction of severe flares. Um, and also we have analyzed uh, our um, real, let's say world uh, experience using the drug from multiple centers in Greece. And we found uh, that uh, with increasing use of the drug, we have an increasing proportion of patients who achieve uh, the targets of low disease activity or remission. And um, here I'm not showing you the baseline data, but the majority of patients included in this study uh, back in 2018, had received at least two uh, DMARs or immunosuppressive agents, and uh, uh, many of them required also low dose of glucocorticoids. So in the context, as I said, of uh, refractory, uh, but not major organ uh, non-life-threatening disease, belimumab is a very good option and helps to achieve uh, the targets uh, of treatment. And, uh, and of course, we uh, confirmed what everyone, has, everyone else has shown that the drug has an excellent safety profile. Uh, there is a faster response uh, of uh, arthritis and hair loss as compared to mucocutaneous disease. And, uh, and also other studies have shown that the pre-existing organ damage reduces the odds of uh, achieving low disease activity remission. Therefore, the earlier they use, the better uh, uh, probably efficacy point, efficacy for this treatment. And, uh, and here are the data from uh, the study from uh, the University of Toronto, where they uh, compared the accrual of damage in the BLIS trials and the long-term extension of phase against historical controls using standard of care. And they confirmed that uh, belimumab uh, can prevent organ damage accrual, which is uh, very important in the context of uh, active refractory uh, disease. And um, I'm not going to spend uh, time on this slide. You already saw the data show from Italy showing that uh, uh, earlier administration of the drug is associated with uh, higher odds for a good clinical response uh, according to the SRI4 uh, index. Now, uh, also anifrolumab uh, is the next biologic to be approved in, in lupus. And there are some questions, however, that have not been um, addressed so far. It's which manifestations respond better with anifrolumab. So I, I showed some evidence that we start having on the limumab. Uh, we, uh, I mean, a variety of different phenotypes can be treated with belimumab, but we do know a few things about which manifestations might respond, how early they might respond, or how late they might respond. Such data uh, coming from the observational studies post-marketing are not yet available with anifrolumab, but hopefully we'll get this kind of uh, results within the next few, uh, few years. And we don't know when we should select a patient to receive the other one drug versus the other. Who is better to receive anifrolumab versus belimumab? Uh, we still don't know the uh, utility in clinical practice of uh, biomarkers like the interferon score. And this is because um, the interferon score in the TULIP trials was significantly reduced, but this did not correlate very well with the clinical response. It did correlate, but only to some extent. And finally, uh, with belimumab, we do know it's long-term safety and efficacy, but with anifrolumab, of course, it's still early, but uh, hopefully we will get this uh, data, which will help us to decide uh, on, uh, on our uh, treatment options. Now, um, when it comes to refractory uh, disease in lupus, there are also uh, scenarios where a patient has an organ dominant manifestation that is not responding to first line treatment. And this can be cutaneous lupus, uh, and we see that frequently. It could be a lupus arthritis patient, 
or uh, let's say other manifestations like serositis, recurrent serositis, or serositis that does not uh, regress uh, after uh, the treatment that we give, like with azathioprine or methotrexate and glucocorticoids. Now, um, I'm not going to spend um, a time to go over the details. Here, we don't have, of course, controlled data to guide the decisions. However, we do have, uh, let's say, uh, observational data that uh, provide some indications about which drugs work better or more often in one manifestation versus the other. So with uh, uh, refractory skin disease, we do have some data to suggest that mycophenolate is effective, especially in subcutaneous, uh, sub, uh, subacute uh, cutaneous lupus. Belimumab, of course, works, especially in acute and subacute lupus. And anifrolumab, we already know that it works uh, well in, uh, in, in extensive skin disease. Uh, so hopefully anifrolumab might be uh, a, a good choice for refractory skin disease to hydroxychloroquine and or methotrexate, let's say. Now, uh, for the severe refractory cases, especially with discoid lupus, thal thalidomide or lenalidomide uh, uh, have been used with success rates reaching up to 90%. And uh, less often are other agents used. Uh, we don't have access and we have no really experience using Dapsone or Quinacrine in, in our setting, but there are reports that these drugs can uh, be effective in, in such cases. Now, if you have a patient with uh, prominent arthritis, belimumab can be used. And Anifrolumab also um, in the combined analysis of the two trials showed superiority over standard of care in treating uh, arthritis. Brituximab is, of course, um, an option for uh, the so-called lupus or very severe RA-like arthritis. And there are also reports of, uh, in selected patients for using uh, non-TNF inhibitors, but also TNF inhibitors in very few, of course, uh, cases. And with uh, refractory cases of serositis, Options can be mycophenolate, but also belimumab and anifrolumab um, on top of glucocorticoids, of course, uh, which uh, and these biologics can be helpful to have a steroid sparing effect uh, without uh, um, reappearance of the serositis. Now, a second case that I would like to discuss with you is a female, 31 years old. Uh, she had lupus with uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And, uh, and while on treatment with hydroxychloroquine, in the past she had received glucocorticoids as azathioprine. Now she has a borderline actually anemia with a hematocrit of, of 27. So if her anemia deteriorates, how should we treat this case? Now in that scenario that we discuss about the second, uh, let's say subset, of disease, who, the so-called uh, severe organ-threatening or life-threatening lupus, like severe thrombocytopenia, pneumonitis, lupus myocarditis, lupus enteritis, all these manifestations that are, can actually cause uh, severe impact on, on patients' lives. Now, in that case, the typical first-line regimen includes high-dose like, uh, glucocorticoids, including pulses, together with either cyclophosphamide in the past, that was actually the single choice. But now we see also patients who do respond also to mycophenolate. We, do, we see patients with severe life-threatening disease who can um, respond to the combination of high-dose glucocorticoids and mycophenolate. But what if the patient does not respond or has a refractory severe disease? Well, in that case, most of the evidence su suggests that rituximab is a good option. It correlates with high response rates, especially in refractory cytopenias. Uh, and you can see here the combined uh, data uh, from many uh, observational studies showing that overall, uh, it leads to a complete response in about half cases, uh, partial response in about a third of patients, and there are a few cases who do not really respond approximately 15 to 20%. Now, these rates are even higher in uh, neuropsychiatric lupus and also in hematological lupus, 
where the response can appear very early, even at three months. And uh, with nephritis, also it's a good option, but I will not go into details about that. Uh, relapses, however, are not uncommon during the taxman treatment. It, uh, they appear about in the 25 up to 40% of patients, but the majority of them will respond to a new cycle, to a new infusion. More and more often, we see reports about using low dose uh, rituximab, uh, like 1,000 uh, milligram every six, let's say, months to maintain the response. So it's something that is also used in vasculitis or in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, still, we are not sure if rituximab should be given as monotherapy or in combination with other agents. I would say that if there is a severe disease, most would use it in combination with azathioprine, methotrexate, or mycophenolate. And if, if it's severe disease, we would repeat at least a second or even a third uh, infusion uh, every six months. But then we could also try the on-demand use depending on how the patient responds. Uh, we still don't know about the utility exactly of monitoring uh, the B cell levels. Some centers uh, have find it useful to, to, to find the chances of uh, response or relapse. Uh, and uh, also another strategy that has been uh, discussed and uh, we do have some preliminary data is the combination of rituximab followed by belimumab. Uh, and this is based, as you probably know, on the fact that the B-cell depletion drives upregulation of BAF levels. And these are the data uh, published at the EULAR, and there is also a, 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 um, a published paper in Lupus showing that this combination can actually lead to significant reduction of added double stranded DNA, prevention of severe flares, and, uh, and uh, without actually an exaggerated um, risk for infections. We still have to see uh, the published, uh, the final published data to see uh, where, uh, which patients could receive this uh, regimen. Now, another option uh, for refractory uh, lupus, especially in neuropsychiatric, uh, is the administration of IVIG, especially in psychosis, acute confusion, in peripheral nerve disorders, it has been used. Plasma exchange, I'm not, uh, I, I only in selected centers, I think it requires a good uh, infrastructure and experience in order to be uh, useful for the patients. And I will close with uh, some novel approaches in, uh, in very refractory cases, like for example, the use of JAK inhibitors. Now JAK inhibitors are very good in suppressing type one interferon signaling. And uh, in fact, there are now ongoing trials in, in lupus. And, and we have seen, um, published data showing that baricitinib, tofacitinib, and other JAK inhibitors can be helpful in, uh, in, uh, in refractory skin disease, like this case with child blame lupus. And uh, another, a couple of uh, impressive uh, uh, novel agents and publications uh, uh, were seen during the last uh, two years. One was with a monoclonal antibody against, against CD38 that uh, depletes also plasma site, plasma cells, uh, daratumumab, which was used in the refractory uh, hematological lupus. And the second was uh, from Erlangen, the administration of photologous CAR-19 directed CAR T cells in a case with very severe refractory lupus nephritis. I think that for the future, we need to see how these approaches can be used for uh, selected patients with severe uh, disease. So these are my conclusions that uh, refractory disease is not uncommon among patients with lupus. Still, we lack a standard uniform definition uh, for uh, refractory disease uh, due to the expanding uh, armamentarium with mycophenolate, with biologics. I believe that SLE patients are now offered with more options to treat such uh, refractory uh, disease manifestations and to uh, get a void of uh, glucocorticoids uh, sooner or later. And for the future, we anticipate that uh, observational studies from large cohorts and translational research uh, will shed light into the 
uh, how we can prioritize the use of specific immunosuppressive or specific biologic agents based on the organ that is mostly affected. Thank you very much. So it's time to discuss. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for these two excellent presentations. Uh, are there already uh, questions from the audience? Uh, if not, uh, actually, the... I, I do have a question. Uh, hello to all of you. This is Laurent Arnaud. Uh, I'm in Porto. Uh, uh, congratulations for both talks. It was really amazing. Uh, I have a question to Marielle. Uh, hello. Thanks for, for your talk. Uh, it's not a very easy question, but I think everybody would like to know the, what you think about that. Uh, you've presented data about uh, belimumab in lupus nephritis, but also voclosporine in lupus nephritis. And so my question is, if you are confronted to a patient with a proliferative lupus nephritis, which one would, would you do treat with belimumab and which patients would you treat with voclosporine? Yeah, of course, that's uh, a great question. And of course, it was talking now with uh, two, two speakers who are much more experienced than I am. But um, it depends. I mean, I would say it depends because uh, if it's like a first uh, recognition of nephritis, it's a, it's a, if it is a first onset and we have a naive patient to whom we would like to approach with a treatment for, for proliferative nephritis, I think I would still feel confident in following um, sort of add-on approach with a um, microphenolate in most of the cases. And nowadays it's possible to already have belimumab on top. I would say that depends on how confident we feel on how confident we feel in judging the disease as very active. So if I would feel from the histology and from the clinical data that the disease deserves already an intense treatment, I would uh, nowadays already go with um, steroid as needed, uh, microphenolate and belimumab. While if I would face uh, a, a mixed class or um, a condition in which we, um, uh, we already detect higher levels of proteinuria, higher than we expect, maybe with uh, an involvement of the, of, the, of the podocyte compartment, which is prominent, um, I would definitely uh, start thinking about adding a, a calcineurin inhibitor from the beginning. Nowadays, like, uh, I, um, I think we cannot yet, uh, I mean, at least in Italy, but I think it's general, voclosporin is not yet here. It will be soon. Uh, but yeah, I would say the approach is, is uh, it could be guided at least uh, also from the prominent feature histological and clinical that one may envision in the, in the, in the, in the biopsy. Um, and if it is a refractory disease, I would like to hear Professor Garcia's opinion, because in that case, maybe CNI could be uh, a, a better option. Yes, this is a very interesting question. I agree that uh, for, uh, for uh, I would probably reserve the use of calcineurin in the cases of uh, severe nephrotic range proteinuria or when there is a uh, membranous class five uh, disease. Uh, whereas when where there is a patient who has a, a multi-systemic disease uh, with involvement of other organs, I believe that the combination of belimumab with mycophenolate uh, could work uh, better. But of course, there are no comparative data so far. We have to be clear with this. Now, for the cases of uh, uh, nephritis that is not uh, that has not uh, responded well. Um, again, uh, both options uh, can be used. Uh, so um, we can also we can both add belimumab to a treat to a patient who has started with induction treatment with mycophenolate, uh, but also uh, calcineurin inhibitors uh, can be used. Um, again, we we don't have really a straightforward uh, way to, to differentiate which should receive what regimen. Uh, uh, more or less the same, let's say, criteria that I discussed and we discussed as uh, for the selection as first line would also uh, be relevant here. Uh, 
So you, if you have a severe ne nephrotic range proteinuria not uh, rapidly resolving, you could uh, add uh, low dose calcineurin. But if you have like a more systemic disease um, or maybe addition of belimumab would seem maybe more appropriate. But I would like to hear also other people's opinion on that. Uh, thank you, Marielle and George, uh, for excellent talks. Uh, thank you, Carlos and Luis, for sharing. And uh, there are a lot of questions, but uh, I, I, I will put two. One is, so best prevention to, to refractory diseases to treat early. Uh, and uh, we had experience uh, with rituximab and David Eisenberg, and now Marielle talks about the, the early use of belimumab. I don't know if we are ready to use belimumab as uh, 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 at the time we, we diagnose the lupus, even before knowing that is a, it will be a good lupus or a very bad lupus. So I want to comment about this. And the other is Marielle also show uh, the, the difference uh, regarding low disease activity and uh, remission uh, uh, in regarding damage. And my question is, how do we know that we should not try to reach remission target and we stop in low disease activity? What is happening? Are we doing the same? Oh, there is a low dose, low, low uh, disease activity. So it's okay for me, I stop. Or should we evolve in therapeutics? Thank you very much. Should I start? Thanks for the question, Professor. Uh, okay, for the first question, um, I think, yes, it's, it's a, a matter also of habit, uh, especially when we talk about onset of disease. I think we should feel ready uh, when possible in using an in-label drug after the failure of steroids and hydroxychloroquine. This is something that is, is probably also um, a shape of mind because it, it came as a new drug and we still feel like it's normal to use the other immunosuppressants earlier. But if we look at the data, I mean, the limumab is approved while the others are not, despite where we know how they work. So we feel that uh, we can handle them. So I, I, I would say we should start thinking different and not seeing that like uh, something heavier or something uh, for refractory disease, because indeed I'm not even sure that it works so well in refractory disease. So, uh, we should maybe get used to, to use it and just bear in mind that we make a reasonable choice when we, uh, of course, there are costs. I mean, I'm just now talking in principle. I know that then we face uh, every time uh, challenges which we don't have time to address right now. But as a, as a, as a concept, as an idea, I feel uh, quite safe in using any label drug, which is licensed, which is indeed uh, uh, approved for the disease itself. And this is the, the first one after a long time. And now we have, uh, I think, sufficient data to say that it's safe uh, and, and, uh, and uh, that it works very, very well when we, when we use it uh, early enough to, um, to sort of shape uh, as much as we can the, the course of disease. So in order, it doesn't really get a bad lupus if we act early enough. So but this is just my, uh, of course, opinion according to the, the experience, to the data we have. Um, of course, I would like to hear all the time Professor Garcia's because it's a great chance for me also. I don't want to take all the, all the space. Um, well, I think this is a very interesting and provocative question. So, yes, I would say that um, there is some rational to believe that if you uh, start early with uh, such a drug that blocks uh, Bliss, a very important uh, factor for the disease pathogenesis, you will uh, change, uh, let's say, the natural history of the disease. Um, and we know that rheumatoid in rheumatoid arthritis, for example, uh, it is well established that um, um, the first, let's say, couple of years are very important in, uh, in ensuring higher efficacy of uh, ADT and F agents and uh, prevention of uh, of bone erosions. 
Now, but we, we still need to see the data here in, for lupus. So I guess that now that the, both the recommendations and the national uh, regulatory agencies, uh, let's say, um, give the option of uh, earlier use of uh, belimumab, not necessarily after uh, trying, let's say, uh, two or three other uh, agents. Uh, we, we, ha we have to gather the data uh, from the patients that will receive earlier the treatment to see whether their disease uh, actually changes in the long term. We, we, don't still, we still don't have uh, sufficient data, although it is true that um, uh, it can prevent uh, flares. Um, however, this disease-modifying, let's say, uh, uh, effect of the drug, I'm not sure if it has been yet clearly demonstrated. Um, then there was a second question uh, about the changes between the difference between remission and low disease activity. Uh, I think that what we see in practice sometimes is that uh, we um, we have some difficulty to control the disease, and um, and um, we we have to balance the, the risk of uh, a continuous, let's say treatment intensifications and the switches, et cetera. Uh, uh, in, and we don't know whether um, we will actually be successful in uh, leading the disease from low dose activity to remission. If it's a patient that uh, is the first time we uh, manage her or him, uh, we can certainly try to reach the your ultimate target, which is remission. But in a patient with long-standing disease that has already changed a couple of uh, treatments, sometimes I, I personally balance that whether uh, uh, continuous treatment changes uh, may carry a risk of, uh, you know, toxicity, bone marrow toxicity, or whatever. But uh, this is I would like to hear also other people's opinion. If I can add something on this, and I think there is uh, now a study in Germany uh, is going to start at least like a, a real trial that would like um, addresses the, the point of bringing the patient to remission because all the data we have are basically about the patient being in remission and persisting or low use activity and persisting in the state. But I am not aware of data which actually state the, uh, or evaluate uh, the effort that is made to bring the patient to the target and how this impacts on further prognosis. So is like Professor just mentioned, if the intensification of the treatment is indeed worth then the, the, the achievement of the target, if it means that the target will be maintained for a longer time, I'm, I, I don't think this was ever assessed. And in our cohort, it was interesting uh, to, to see that um, uh, a damage and an SDI uh, index uh, uh, Z, uh, equal to zero was associated with a greater chance of reaching remission. But in fact, this doesn't make so much sense because in the definition, the damage is not included. So what is possible is that that damage in real life is mistreated as activity. And in that case, uh, so the patient keeps on receiving uh, um, uh, consistent amount of steroids, even though they would not be needed because uh, what is treated is not uh, active disease, but damage. So while in that case, of course, it's, it, it doesn't make any sense to struggle to, uh, to bring the patient to remission to switch off a manifestation which is not any more susceptible of immunosuppression. Luis, uh, do you have some comments, Luis Inez, or questions, please? I don't know. Yes, thank you. It was uh, two very interesting uh, presentations, uh, the lecture by Maria Algato and uh, George Bertzis, and actually they are very complementary between them. Uh, uh, Maria Algato talked about the importance of controlling early the, the disease to prevent damage accrual, while George Bertzis talked about the options to control refractory disease. And uh, also was talking uh, now in the discussion about uh, some concepts from the, the area of rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, one concept from that area is the concept of uh, a window of opportunity. And uh, I would like 
to hear your comments from, from both. If you think we can and we should define a window of opportunity to achieve a trip to target, be it, be it remission or low disease activity, to uh, optimize long term outcomes. Uh, uh, or or are, we, are we not there yet? Okay, we saw the last three questions. If I can make a first uh, I, I, I point. This is very interesting. I, I don't have a, a definitive answer. I would, uh, because we have seen, however, uh, that the damage accrues uh, early, uh, even within the first year, actually, or the second year, I, I would narrow the window of opportunity down to one or two years uh, uh, as an as a important period to achieve a good control of the disease. Uh, but also by extrapolation from lupus nephritis, where we do have more uh, like uh, time series data with the response and, uh, um, and remission of the disease. Thank you. The last uh, three questions, very, very uh, uh, Thank but you. First, my one <laughs> is uh, to you, George. In the last slide, sorry. In the last slide, you have shown an antibody against the long life plasma in lupus, uh, I, I think. So, my question is lupus with infection or doesn't matter? Uh, if I, I can, can you repeat? The last yes. slide. There yes. In New England Journal of Medicine. You yes, the CAR T cells. Do you remember? Yes. Okay, so my yes. question is, the loops with infection or doesn't matter, with or without? Uh, if, if there is no, a it's risk not for- the study, it's not the study. Yes. It's his opinion. As an opinion for, uh, if there is a risk for infection with these treatments. Okay. Yes, uh, if I understood correct, Yes, there is always, but with, uh, I believe with the CAR T cell approach, there was no such a risk because this is a very targeted treatment with um, autologous uh, cells engineered to target uh, CD19. However, um, yes, these approaches have a very short duration. In both trials, I believe the duration was a follow-up was a few months. And, uh, and we have learned afterwards that these patients also relapsed. So, uh, I mean, we still have to see more data uh, and to balance the risk of efficacy and safety. So Sorry, uh, I have a quick and practical question about uh, what Lorraine Arnaud uh, said before. In uh, your clinical practice, uh, at the beginning, if you have a patient with lupus nephritis in the first episode, uh, besides mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide, when we use at the beginning uh, voclosporin or belimumab? Yeah, uh, uh, you have an additional question to this. Sorry. Sorry? Uh, I didn't get your additional question to this. So I'm, how, uh, I'm, how... My question is... Uh, if you have a patient with lupus, with lupus nephritis, in the first episode at the beginning, you, you will use yeah. mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide, but at the beginning, in a, what kind of patients we will use voclosporine besides mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide and uh, belimumab? In what kind of patients we will use it, both drugs or one drug at the beginning, in the first episode? Yeah, I see your point. Um, so, I mean, that's just theoretical because I haven't used voclosporine Clostering so far as, as most of us. Uh, so in the very beginning, uh, I think uh, if the disease is highly active or also as Professor Bercy has mentioned, if it is within a frame of this systemic disease, and if you have like crescents in the histology, high proliferation, uh, immunocomplexes, subendothelial deposition, then in my view, it makes sense to reinforce the, uh, the drugs with the, uh, at least the greater uh, anti-inflammatory potential. So in, in this way, I would probably go for 
um, uh, microphenolic plus bulimumab, that's uh, my opinion, while if I would notice that there is already uh, an involvement uh, of the podocyte barrier, which is quite uh, prominent, if I would notice uh, and protic proteinuria, maybe not so, so many signs of activity in the urine, so no blood, uh, or even uh, an nephritis, uh, which doesn't have a very active serology. So I would, you would have proteinuria with, a, let's say, uh, a, a membranous histology or uh, the presence of podocytopathy associated. Maybe you have a quite uh, uh, smoldering serology, so not so high anti-DSDNA, not so, so much complement consumption. Maybe in those patients, I would see a better chance of adding calcineurin inhibitors. That's just in theory from the data we have from the mechanisms of action which are described. The last question, That's Lauren. Thank you very much. I just wanted to come back to the question asked by Professor Vasconcelos. Um, when we l listen to the, the presentations, we may have the idea that remission and low disease activity are protecting, protective in the same manner. They, they reduce the risk of uh, damage, they reduce mortality. But I think it's super important to underline that what is actually matters is the time spent in this state. If you reach remission just a little bit, you are strongly protected against mortality and damage, and you are protected with the same magnitude with low disease activity, but you have to spend 50% of the visit in that state of low disease activity. So low disease activity, of course, is less powerful than remission. This was just what I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, I think it depends a lot on the definition that we use, of course, and how would you quantify 50, 25%? I think it's important. This is still an open issue to be addressed. I agree that it would be great to have also safety threshold that we can aim at to know that if we are so good to maintain the patient in the state for a consistent period of time, then we are confident that the damage will not accrue so much, but I totally agree. And yeah, of course, I thank you for your comment. So, Finish. So, uh, Rick? Oh, I'm sorry. We, I don't see you. Oh, well, go ahead. No, I think it's not. So, Luis, we can close the, the section. What do you think? Yes, thank you very Let much. You for... hear me. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, both of you, Gabriel and the George, for for this magnificent session because increased the knowledge of us. Thank you very much.